extremely gentle and, of course, very modern apes. You may not know this, but a lot of creationists out there don't really like me very much. Does that shock you? So allow me to take you back in time for a moment, back when I was really engaged in the debate circuit here on YouTube. If you haven't been following me for very long, you might not know this, but I've done a lot of debates here on the platform, and I used to do them way more frequently, but that was before a lot of the major platforms uh, had content like this, and also before I debated most willing creationists. So back then, I went on several different channels, and one of those was one of the smaller ones at the time, the Theology Unleashed, and it was on that channel that I had the opportunity to debate Gunter Beckley. Beckley is a PhD paleontologist and employee of the intelligent designed think tank, the Discovery Institute. Yes, that one. This, uh, I mean... <laughs> Beckley's actual doctorate is in geosciences, and his specialty is in insect systematics. The Discovery Institute itself is probably best known for trying to get intelligent design in schools and taught alongside conventional evolutionary theory by natural processes, and it's also probably best known for its crushing defeat at the hands of conventional science in the U.S. court systems in the famous case Kitzmiller v. Dover. That sounds like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> Hilariously and coincidentally, this past weekend was the AABA's, and it was at the Matt Cartnell Symposium there at the conference that I, I actually got to meet Eugenie Scott. She gave me her business card and everything, so I, I hope I'm going to get her on this channel and discuss the, the Kitzmiller versus Dover trial at some point. Anyways, on Theology Unleashed, Gunter Beckley and I debated the concept of intelligent design, and I'm pretty happy with my performance in that debate. I would rather call it a discussion, to be perfectly honest. I think all of those are really more discussions than they are anything else. But it was civil, it was cordial, it was fun. So this, this is cool. So that's very nice. It was really fun to talk to you. Um, yeah. Hope you. we can repeat this someday. I, I had a lot of fun Absolutely. too. Again, those of you who didn't follow my d debate circuit, my debate bro arc, might not know, but like my, my style was always kind of a kind and cordial, let's have a chat rather than, you know, aggressive fighting blood sports type thing. That was never like a, a tactic that I was using to lure my opponents into a false sense of security so I could go in for the kill, as I've been accused sometimes by people that I've had not so cordial engagements with after initial civility. The thing is, is when you go toe to toe with someone on the internet, oftentimes it can start off pretty kind and then their uh, like provocation happens. And um, well, I'm not like a passive doormat. If someone is rude to me, I'm going to be rude back. I don't think that's a unique human characteristic either. Most people will be cordial with someone else until given a reason not to be. So, you know, enough with the ominous foreshadowing, right? I had a conversation with Gunter Beckley on Theology Unleashed that went pretty well. It was civil, it was enjoyable by both parties, and um, I, I kind of just left it at that. This was, again, several years ago. So imagine my surprise when out of the blue, a viewer of mine forwards me one of Gunter Beckley's most recent articles. In fact, it was his most recent article, uh, and it's about me. The Discovery Institute has written about me before. You might remember going back and forth with Emily Reeves on this channel about primate phylogeny and the statistical likelihood that the patterns that we see in the primate fossil record, biogeography, and genetics can actually be explained by anything other than a common ancestor amongst all members of the order. But this was by Gunther, and Gunther has never written about me before. So I thought, this will be fun. I can't wait to check it out. I wonder what Gunter Beckley has to say about me. Embarrassingly dumb, garbage, ignorant, a waste of my time, careless. Maybe science just is not your thing. Hey yo, what the? <laughs> wow, huh? Gunter, 
What a top-notch, out-of-left-field hit piece you have there. And it's not just those little insults that I just showed you there. No, this thing is just smattered with language like that. The whole thing is dripping with disdain, evidently for me as a person. And, like, I look back on it and I wish that I made it, like, a physical altercation. That's crazy. Like, I'm like, I should just punch that bitch in the face. <laughs> well I mean, sheesh. What did I do to you, Dr. Beckley, to deserve this kind of treatment? Now, I suspect that this behavior is lashing out because he knows that I helped Dave Farina with his bust of Gunther's mischaracterization of the hominin fossil record, but like, I helped with the facts there. It's no secret that Dave Farina, Professor Dave, and I have kind of different styles when it comes to dealing with creationist nonsense. He's a little bit more aggressive than I am. So like if Gunther is making this thing because he thinks that I was like insulting him in Dave's video, that is just an incorrect <laughs> thing to think. But like that's also ironic because Gunther has said this in the past on Professor Dave's content. In the first five minutes he calls intelligent design proponents class charlatans, frauds, and liars, and calls intelligent design arguments, pseudoscience, rubbish, osmaniol, and dishonest treppe. And yet, I would characterize what he has written about me in this article as very similar to what he has just chastised Dave for. So right off the bat, Gunther is being super hypocritical, right? He's using very aggressive language that he has gotten on other people's case for, but his is actually worse because it is unprovoked, and that is what makes him a jerk. So why would Beckley do this? That's a great question. I've been wondering that myself. But it doesn't really matter now, does it? Because now, I'm irritated. So irritated, in fact, that in the midst of still writing my NSF proposal and getting ready to pitch my project to my advisors, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and make a mean video about Gunther Beckley. And we're gonna explore some of the things that he says in this article and some of the things that he said in the past. So congratulations, Gunther, you forced my hand. You acted like a huge jerk to me, and it's like I said in the email that I sent you, I certainly hope that you won't be surprised when this attitude is returned to you. And I'll go ahead and add here, uh, with interest. So with that, it's time for a costume change. Gunter Beckley starts this incomplete, selective, and ignorant piece on me with a background description. His little blog post here on Evolution News, again, an intelligent design think tank titled Fossil Friday, Stone Huts, Homo Habilis, and Guts a Gibbon. He says, this Fossil Friday will be a bit different, and we'll show you how an aspiring young anthropologist, that's me, came to agree that a young Earth creationist video made a valid point against human evolution. Here's the truly remarkable story. Well, that is tantalizing, isn't it? A PhD student of biological anthropology named Erica runs one of the more popular anti-creationist YouTube channels under her pseudonym, Guts at Gibbon. Okay, so far so good. Apparently, she feels she has to hide her real identity behind a pseudonym because it's so dangerous to publicly defend the mainstream consensus in academia and mock dissenters who risked or even sacrificed their careers by speaking out. Okay. So yes, Gunther starts off this article by being upset that I use a pseudonym and don't have my last name public on my YouTube channel. Gunther, this is not because I'm afraid to defend the mainstream position, it's because I'm afraid that my dissenters, the people on the internet who don't like what I say, will have a psychotic break someday, much like the one you're having in this article, come to my workplace where they know I'm at, because if you have my name, you know the university that I work at, and perhaps harm or kill me. This is actually something that happens sometimes with public internet personalities. They get doxxed or they're found out, their actual identity is discovered by people who don't like them very much, people who might want to harm them, and then those people do harm them. And I would like to avoid that if at all possible. As for intelligent design proponents losing their jobs because they've been public on their perspective on that kind of thing, I empathize. But at the same time, intelligent design was like pushed through the court system to attempt to get it 
taught alongside evolutionary theory in public schools. And remember, intelligent design has no model. This is genuinely a hunch in a lot of cases that usually religious individuals want to be taught alongside conventional science, which is of course inappropriate, and why a Bush-appointed judge was convinced of this to the degree that he declared intelligent design repackaged creationism uh, and not scientific. So I really don't think them losing their jobs is so much about being an intelligent design proponent, but rather being allied with an organization that seeks to use the courts as a bludgeon to force their intuition into public schools. And if you don't like that people are wary of intelligent design proponents after what happened in 2005, well, I don't really know what to tell you, Gunter. Gunter goes on to say, nevertheless, I had a quite long and civil debate. Again, I'm gonna say it was disgusting discussion with her, which you can watch online if you have the enthusiasm for almost 3.5 hours of talking about the fossil record, evolution, and intelligent design. I thought that after this conversation, it might be worthwhile to stay in touch, so I emailed her June 2nd and 3rd, 2021, with some detailed information she had asked for in our talk concerning antifreeze proteins and mutation rates in whales. Unfortunately, she never responded to my mails. It's true, I forgot to email him back. Um, I'm a really busy person, I'm a PhD student, and I also manage a relatively large YouTube channel, and because of that, I get a whole lot of emails, and I have been getting a whole lot of emails basically since I hit a thousand subscribers, and then I also have to keep up with my, my student and faculty email, being a, a TA and a student at my university. This is not so much meant to be a justification as an explanation for why I forgot to email Gunther back. Anyways, I rectified that, I emailed him back. I wondered briefly if like that's what set Gunter off, that he was just a powder keg waiting to explode and after enough time he was finally just like so mad that I didn't email him back that he decided to write this hit piece. But I think it probably had more to do with the fact that I helped write one of uh, Professor Dave's scripts against Gunter, specifically on his bungling of the hominin fossil record, but you know, we'll, we'll get there when we get there. He goes on to say, anyway, I recently stumbled across a new video from her on Atheist R and Ra's YouTube channel. This is not a new video. This thing was released months, if not years ago, which is a part of a series of rebuttal videos against the documentary movie Genesis Impact that you can watch for free on YouTube as well. The latter was produced by an American young earth creationist organization named Genesis Apologetics. Pause. I hope you guys know about Genesis Impact, but if you don't, I can sum it up for you very easily, and those of you who have been around my channel will know the severity of the crimes committed in Genesis Impact. It is basically a movie version of Contested Bones. Um, and in fact, they cite Contested Bones as one of their sources in several of the videos. Keep that in mind, because if you will remember from Contested Bones, or if you watched that video series that I did with Aaron, you will remember or recall that almost everything that they say is so boldly incorrect so as to be offensive. So keep that in mind because what Gunther says here in a moment, uh, that has some implications on, on what he says. He says, since I am not a proponent of this view at all and am on record as subscribing to an old earth and common descent, put an asterisk next to the common descent thing because Gunther really wobbles on that. Sometimes he supports common descent, sometimes not so much. I might be an unlikely candidate to defend this movie against attacks. However, when I watched, I found it was quite well done and well researched, certainly not without errors, but raising many valid points against the mainstream view on evolution. Yet you showed us pictures of Lucy rendered by different artists with human-like hands, feet, and even eye whites. Could you pull that one up? Do apes even have eye whites, like the picture you showed? No. Oh dear, that's not good. I feel the need to say the F word now. Hey, Gunter, like what? Other than the one that you're going to present in, in this article here, what do you think they said that was correct? Because I've really gone in depth into their source material, Contested Bones, which is just a more detailed version of the actual Genesis Impact movie, truly. Um, and there are so many incorrect things per chapter that it has taken me years to actually get through the entire book uh, in video format. This, my copy of Contested Bones is annotated to hell. And um, I, I simply can't find the time to, to go through every single thing that's incorrect. And I'm sure I'm even missing things from saying that Lucy was a quadruped to forgetting that the foramen magnum was preserved in Artipithecus ramidus. It's just beginning to end sloppy. 
And for Gunter to defend Genesis Impact and by association the contested bones text in any shape, form, or fashion reveals to me that he knows even less about hominid evolution than I had previously thought. Um, the, the level of ineptitude to say something like this is staggering. So he goes on to say, on the other hand, the reaction video rebutting Genesis Apologet or rebutting Genesis Impact 5, Homo habilis, by Aaron Ra and Gutsy Gibbon was not just beyond awful and factually bonkers, but also exhibited a very off-putting arrogance that backfires badly. Wow, we're going to see how ironic that statement is over the course of this video. Let's have a look at the background information first. Gunter explains the background information pretty well, but I want to give some background to the background. So Aaron Ra is another YouTuber. Most of you guys, if you're here, you probably know who he is. He does a lot of creationism debunks as well. And he and I collaborated on basically going piece by piece through Genesis Impact, again, the video version of Contested Bones, wherein young earth creationists tried to debunk the hominin fossil record and assert that every hominin is either fully human or fully ape, as in non-human ape. They think that apes and humans are different things. Again, as, I as we always say, it would be like saying that a dog is not a canine, but I digress. Now, in Genesis Impact, the, the portion that we're going to be talking about today has to do with Homo habilis, and Arne and I did an entire episode just on each individual hominin covered. So Gunter is covering specifically my video with Arne on Homo habilis within Genesis Impact, and within that framework, he is honing in on a very specific portion of that video, which has to do with the Olduvai Gorge DK site as excavated by Mary Leakey. Now, here's the short form of the argument. At the DK site, you have a ton of stone tools, you have a lot of butchered animal bones with cut marks and things like that, and you also have the remains of Homo habilis, a hominin that is proposed to span the difference between earlier Australopiths and later early members of genus Homo, such as Homo ergastus. Now, the reason Homo habilis, and sometimes by extension Homo rudolfensis, are proposed to be this missing link, as it were, between earlier Australopiths and other later members of genus Homo, I should say other later early members of genus Homo, is because of its morphology and temporal location as compared to these other two groups. The first member of Australopithecus is Australopithecus adamensis at roughly 4.2 million years ago, and the first member of genus Homo is found 2.8 million years ago at Leti Gararu, with a mandible that most paleoanthropologists I know propose as Homo habilis. But even if it's not, the first member of bona fide Homo habilis is 2.4 million years ago. The first member of Homo erectus, which is sometimes conflated with Homo ergaster and Homo georgicus, so we're talking about Homo erectus sensuleto, is 2.4 2 million years old. So these groups succeed one another temporally, and they also have successive morphologies that trend towards later genus Homo, things like Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. I'm going to give you a quick important description of Homo habilis, morphologically speaking, as compared to earlier Australopiths and something like Homo ergaster or Homo erectus sensuleto, because it's going to be really, really important moving forward with all the Gunter Beckley articles that we have to discuss. Homo habilis is a mixture of derived and basal traits as compared to Australopithecus and later Homo erectus sensuleto. Like the Australopiths before it, it was fully committed to bipedality on the ground, but had a small brain case size that ranged from 509 cc's to 777 cc's. This is important because this range overlaps with both the largest Australopith brains and the smallest Homo erectus sensuleto brains. But that is not the only characteristic of Homo habilis that is fairly intermediate. Its face-to-brain case ratio is intermediate between Australopithecus or Paranthropus and later members of genus Homo, as are some minute aspects of its teeth. The tarsals and the pelvic complex are both intermediate mosaics, possessing characteristics of both Australopiths and later members of genus Homo, but some aspects ally it with only one or the other. Homo habilis has smaller jaws than the Australopiths before it, looking more like genus Homo. However, the teeth within the jaws look mostly like Australopithecus. The canines look primitive, but the clavicle looks modern. The hand looks modern, but the wrist looks primitive. Basically, a Homo habilis is a grab bag morphology that 
places it as a clear transition from Australopithecus to what we will later see in genus Homo. This transition is so smooth that in one of the most famous papers on the topic, Australopithecus to Homo, the transition that wasn't, Kimball and Vilmore argued that really there isn't a single characteristic in Homo habilis or genus Homo in general that didn't have precursors in genus Australopithecus. And in fact, of those who argue that Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis should not be in genus Homo and should instead either be their own genus or should be subsumed into Australopithecus, namely Wood and Collard in their seminal 1998 work, the characteristics that they use to oust Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis are almost entirely behavioral. Homo habilis cannot be excluded from genus Homo on the basis of morphology, only on adaptive regime, and as they say, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. This has been further complicated by the fact that even smaller-brained, more primitive-looking members of Homo erectus have been found also with the absence of certain characteristics that would land them in the genus Homo adaptive regime. Wouldn't you know it, the morphology and behavior seems to be a big smudge where you can't tell where Australopithecus ends and Homo begins. Wow, that sounds a lot like evolution to me. Boy, I sure can't wait for Gunter to talk about the craniodental and postcranial characteristics of Homo habilis and to make a case that it shouldn't be in genus Homo, because he's definitely going to do that, right? So back to the grind here, Gunter goes on to say, the Genesis Impact movie made the following argument against Homo habilis as a transitional form between ape-like australopiths and modern humans, and he gives the time code. In the lowest archaeological beds of Olduvai Gorge in Kenya, where the type fossils of the ancient hominin Homo habilis were discovered, the scientists also found a 12-foot circular stone hut foundation made of lava rocks, and this structure had six heaps of stones spaced 2 to 2.5 feet apart for inserting support poles. They describe the stone circle as having a striking similarity to the shelters made by present-day nomads in the area today. The movie also emphasizes the point that outside the hut are 348 bones of eight species of slaughtered animals were found, but only 11 small fragments and teeth inside the hut area. Thus, 97% of the animal bones were found outside the hut foundations. Likewise, 96%, 48 out of 50 pieces, of the byproduct flakes and chips of debitage were found outside the hut foundations. The movie then concludes that this evidence suggests modern humans lived here, and not apes or ape men. The movie reports that this aligns with the opinion of Mary Leakey, the leading paleo expert. Well, just as I thought, trash. For this locality, so just so you know what kind of uh, brass we're dealing with here, who argued that the huts were man-made artificial structures because of the distribution of stones in the stone circle and the disproportionate dis distribution of animal bones and stone tool flakes inside and outside the stone circle, including a two-foot buffer zone around the circle. Leakey said that the structure looked very much like the stone hut foundations people in the same area built today. The movie even shows a slide with a photo of such a hut labeled Leakey 1979 Plate 3 as its source, Keep it in mind, as this will be important later on. So, couple of quick notes here before we move on. This entire argument made by Genesis Impact that Gunter states and then argues agrees with the opinion of Mary Leakey, this just was Mary Leakey's argument. Like, there's nothing new that Genesis Apologetics added, right? They say it and then they're like, this agrees with Mary Leakey. No, guys, you, you took that idea from Mary Leakey, and Mary Leakey also did not suggest that modern humans did it. This bed, this site, is dated to roughly 1.9 million years ago, so nearly a million years younger than the oldest member of genus Homo remains that we have, which again is that Leti Gararu material. Now this excavation is on bed 1 and bed 2, the DK site, right? In bed one at the DK site, you find Homo habilis, and it's argued that you also find Homo habilis in the lower portion of bed two. At the upper portion of bed two, you have Homo erectus. What this suggests, of course, is that Homo habilis lived at the site, and then Homo erectus lived at the site. It used the same site later on in time. Human societies do this today because, as it turns out, we tend to have similar preferences for spots on the landscape that are beneficial to us. Now, this doesn't mean that nowhere in the world Homo habilis and Homo erectus weren't contemporaneous with one another. It means that at this site, 
no one is arguing that, at least that, that I could find, other than the creationists. Like, no paleoanthropologist is arguing that, as Beckley is going to, to double down on here, and as Genesis Apologetics argued, that Homo erectus, which all of them think is just a human, of course they ignore all of the morphologic reasons why it is not the same species as Homo sapiens, but they think that Erectus did the stone structure and all the stone tools, and that it was preying upon Homo habilis, at the site, just a dumb ape, the victim of the bushmeat trade. In their mind, this would preclude Homo habilis from being a transitional species because reasons. I'm not sure how they think that works because Homo habilis is associated with stone tools elsewhere too, not just at this site. I guess they think that it's like, oh, if this is definitely a stone structure that was built associated with Homo erectus instead of Homo habilis, Homo habilis must have been measurably dumber, measurably less competent than Homo erectus, and therefore that is where the gap lies. Homo habilis is just an australopith, and Homo erectus is a clear delineation that separates the human kind from the ape kind. That's where I think they're going with this, and Beckley kind of makes similar points in these other articles that we're going to touch on later. This is a ridiculous argument to make because of what we previously talked about. The temporal succession of Homo erectus following Homo habilis following Australopithecus, the morphologic transition that we see between these three groups, and a paper came out just in 2023 that talks about how the stone tools associated with Homo habilis are themselves transitional stone tools that appear to link later Oldowan tool sets and earlier Acheulean tool sets. So isn't that wonderful? Gunter doesn't care about any of that though because he is just unbothered by data that <laughs> precludes his ideas here, or at least greatly challenges them. He goes on to say this argument is also elaborated with more background information on the movie's accompanying webpage on Homo habilis by Genesis Apologetics, which provides further sources to Leakey 1971, should be 1972, and 1979. It also makes clear that the stone circle was found at DKIA level 3 lower bed 1, and several Homo habilis bones were found above this structure. So I want to make something clear as well here, that that Beckley knows about the site, right? I have it pulled up here, and we'll come back to this later, but this is the Genesis Apologetics um, accompanying webpage with all their sources from their section on Homo habilis in Genesis Impact. So Beckley knows that this site exists, he's aware of it, Please keep that in mind moving forward. His next section, titled Embarrassingly Dumb, he says, in their embarrassingly dumb rebuttal video, that's not a great composition, but whatever, Arn Ron and Gutsy Gibbon spend large parts of their 1.5 hour time on stuff that has nothing to do at all with the Genesis Impact movie, such as the straw man argument, if we came from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Uh, Gunther's using the wrong there here, so that's great which is nowhere to be found in the movie, or stuff about the origin of bird feathers, which is totally unrelated to the movie, as well as boring stereotypical rants of how stupid religious believers are and how wonderful and enlightened scientists are. No, the problem is not religious believers. The problem is young earth creationists and like ID proponents like yourself, Gunter, right? There are plenty of science affirming religious folks that I at least am very clear I have zero problem with. The issue is with the dismissal of like conventional science because it imposes on your specific interpretation of Genesis, which is something that intelligent design proponents do all the time, um, just not as much perhaps as the young earth creationists. Now, I don't personally care if you dislike the way that Arn and I did our coverage, right? We are not strictly limited to arguments that have direct counterparts in the video because it's our video, and we can talk about whatever we want on it. Um, we do not have to run a Beckley-approved check to put something out on YouTube, believe it or not. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you <laughs> We don't care. So Gunter doesn't like it, don't care, plus didn't ask. He goes on to say, when they address the movie, they either avoid the main points or even implicitly confirm them, but consider them irrelevant. Now, this portion implicitly confirming them, concerning them irrelevant. He's gonna elaborate on this. Uh, avoiding the main points, like what, Gunter? Because you don't mention any of those points in this article or in any other place. So I think you just put that in there because it sounded good. 
Uh, and if I'm wrong here, I'm sure we will find out in another vitriolic blog post after you see this video. The only substantial critique in the video that allegedly debunks a central argument concerns the issues of the stone circle. Wrong, because we talk extensively about the craniodental features and the mosaic nature of Homo habilis, specifically talking about how young Earth creatious never mention any of these things. Uh, this is something that you will not touch on in here because, of course, I've read the article many times already. Gutsy Gibbon, who was invited by R.M. Ra as an expert on human origins, argues that this is all creationist nonsense and false information. Yes, because it it mostly is. <laughs> Everything in Genesis Impact is mostly false information because, again, it's predicated um, on the contested bones information, which is, in fact, all creationist nonsense and false information. Hyperbolic, but you get what I'm saying. Based on misunderstanding real science and either deliberate lies or at least careless confusion of two different archaeological sites in Kenya, one in the early Pleistocene of Olduvai Gorge, where Homo habilis was found in the 1960s, and the other at the Iron Age site of Hyrax Hill, where stone huts were found in the 1930s. This is an important point. We're going to come back to it in a second. But first, let's find out why Gunther is bothering. The reason I decided to waste my time in responding to the total garbage video by R. and Ron Gutsit Gibbon is that it implicitly attacks me. Gunter, I don't think about you at all, right? Like, you, you make this argument because it's arguing against something you have previously said, and if Genesis apologetics are wrong, so are you. Uh, and we were about to find out that that is in fact the case. This is because I had basically made the same point about the stone huts in a Fossil Friday article last summer, which also argues that we now know that more modern Homo erectus was a contemporary of Homo habilis and the latter and Australopithecine, which was not a handyman, but more likely the bushmeat game of real human hunters who built the stone huts and stone tools. So Beckley has numerous articles that try to make the points that he just said in this little paragraph, in this little section of a little paragraph, and all of them are incorrect, as we will discover uh, here later on. But for now, I would like you to appreciate the fact that, no, contemporary um, literature does not think that Homo habilis at this site was the game of Homo erectus, and does not think that Homo habilis was an australopith. Okay? Neither of those is the case. Now, Homo habilis and Homo erectus were contemporaneous at other locations, but not at this one. And this is important because the contemporaneity at other locations does not share the same temporal frame as this site. So is this true? Did Genesis impact and I get the facts right? Or is Gutsit Gibbon right with her assumed debunking of the stone hut argument? Well, you don't need to dive deep into the technical literature, which would, of course, drive home this point beyond any doubt, such as the excavation ports by Leakey 1972, or the standard textbook on paleoanthropology, Biagi 2015, or various articles. It would have been fully sufficient to Google some brief blog posts by Restberger 2007 about the discovery, or even check Wikipedia, which explicitly affirms the claim with sources, and then they have the a Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia quote here that describes the site, talks about Mary Leakey's suggestion, uh, and talks about modern day nomadic tribes. Basically, it's just talking about what Mary Leakey said. So what Gunther is basically saying here is that Genesis Apologetics was extremely thoughtful with their sourcing and that they included their sources so that you could go and dig in a little bit more and see what it is that they were talking about specifically. Now. Here's where I've got a cop to a mistake on my part for being not as careful as I could be. So to Gunther's credit, maybe careless is a good way of describing at least my discussion on this particular topic. In my conversation with Aaron, I explicitly talk about how Genesis apologetics is incorrect in their association of Homo habilis with this mysterious stone circle in Kenya. And I point out that Hyrax Hill doesn't actually have any associations with Homo habilis. And in fact, to make matters even worse, not only is it like hundreds of miles away, an eight hour drive from where Homo habilis remains were actually found at Olduvai Gorge, but also it has been radiocarbon dated to being approximately an Iron Age formation. So how embarrassing for Genesis apologetics using an Iron Age structure to support their notion that modern humans were hunting Homo habilis at Olduvai Gorge. And with regard to me, that's really Gunter's thesis statement with regard to this entire article. Gutsit Gibbon incorrectly dunked on Genesis Apologetics, saying that they were talking about Hyrax Hill when actually they really were talking about an old device site. Naughty, naughty. And to support this, he also shows like how easy it is to find like the, the stone circle formation in general, like by citing like Encyclopedia Britannica and going to a bunch of random textbooks and saying, see, see, it's so clear that a stone circle is associated at Olduvai 
with Homo habilis. I'm gonna note here something important that's gonna come into play later, which is that every one of his sources that talks about this stone circle specifically notes that calling it like a, an occupation or like a, a hut is something that Mary Leakey additionally suggested, Mary Leakey being the one who discovered it. She's the only one that's ever cited as saying that this thing is, is a hut or some kind of structure. So there was Mary Leakey here. Here's another in her interpretation. This is from a book by Tim Ingold, who is a social anthropologist. Anyways, Gunter is really like jazzed by this fact that I've made this mistake. So he goes down and talks more about how uh, <laughs> the stone circle is so easy to find, right? In Mary Leakey's original 1971 and 72 excavation report that was shown in the movie, clearly features the stone circle as well as various animal bones with their determinations. And in fact, when we go over to the Genesis Apologetics page, you can see those little images that they've uploaded. They have some of the figures, again, reproduced here as Citation 10, down here discussing Citation 12, and then there's Citation 11 that is also referring to the 12-foot circular foundation here. This is going to be important for later, so keep that in mind. So Gunter goes on to, uh, to say this, I suggest it would not have been too much to ask from a PhD student to at least Google or check an encyclopedia before slandering others for incompetence or even accusing them of lying by alleged spreading of false information. Now, I'm going to pause for a second here. This is not the reason why I think Genesis Impact and Contested Bones, both sort of affiliates of Genesis Apologetics generally, uh, are incompetent or spreading false information, right? This would have been like a grain of sand in the hourglass. It was a grain of sand in the hourglass out of everything that Arn and I covered that like explicitly was them either being incompetent or spreading false information. Again, I will direct you to the fact that they think Lucy was a quadruped. And again, I will direct you to the issues with Ornipithecus, not preserving the frame and magnum, them saying that it didn't, or at least heavily insinuating it, right? That's not the reason. This is just another drop in that bucket, Gunther. Again, I will suggest that you actually watch all of Genesis Impact or read Contested Bones uh, before you go around uh, slandering me, saying that I'm, I'm not doing my due diligence here. Uh, again, your hypocrisy is on full display. But Gunter is still right that I conflated Hyrax Hill and um, the the DK site here in Old Divide, that I was saying that they were citing Hyrax Hill and then basically arguing with Hyrax Hill instead of actually arguing with, with the DK site, which Gunter is saying they were actually talking about. And uh, he's very smug about this. He says, obviously, our anonymous Erica, like that really bothers him. Uh, and I think it's because he lost his Wikipedia page for being an intelligent design proponent, uh, which I, I wish I could say I empathized with, uh, but I don't because all of my information and affiliations are still intact because I'm not an intelligent design proponent. Erica still has a lot to learn about paleoanthropology before she is ready for a PhD in this field, starting with basics like properly researching sources, Gunter, baby, you're going to have a real issue with, with, with this little statement later. We're going to keep that one in mind. However, if you are so careless in your research and obviously guided by prejudice and bias, then maybe science is not really your thing. Oof. Owie ouch. What an awful thing to say. But what about this other Iron Age site? Indeed, Leakey1943 had also described an Iron Age, Iron Age hut from a different site in Kenya called Hyrax Hill 30 years before the discoveries of the stone circle uh, at the Homo habilis site of Old Divide Gorge. The two have nothing to do with each other, and it is Gutsy Gibbon who is confusing the two and is ignorant about the discovery at Old Divide Gorge, even though this was clearly explained in elaborate detail in the reviewed movie with all the sources provided. So, you know, this was weird to me, right? Because I, I do a lot of interviews, and I've said this to Gunter, I was like, hmm, what a weird mistake for me to have made. I wonder what was going through my head. Like, I wonder what happened, why I made this mistake. Uh, do a little post-mortem here, because as everybody on this channel is aware of, I, I hopefully have continued to have this reputation for admitting when I'm wrong. I never want people on my channel to get incorrect information. And so when it's pointed out to me that I'm incorrect, uh, I own it, and then more importantly, I fix the mistake. So I went to go uh, see see what I was thinking here, and I went to the Genesis Apologetics site for Homo habilis, which is where I got my sources from. You know, Gunther's doing all of this uh, hullabaloo and, and shouting and being angry here in his blog post about how, oh, you could have done like a simple Google search. Now, my source methods are I go to the sources that they cited. Right, so that's what I did first, uh, and that's going to be very elucidating here for, for what ended up happening, at least on my end. So I went to their 
their site, right, here, Homo habilis. Again, this is their associated with Genesis Apologetics Impact, the Homo habilis episode. And as we scroll down to where our pictures are, the pictures of what they're actually talking about here, we have citation 10, and we have citation 11, and citation 12. Citation 10 is the first that is really explicitly talking about this figure and talking about this site, the DK Old Device site. They say the clues, the clues don't end with stone tools. The evidence that humans were actually the inhabitants of this site is also confirmed by a 12-foot circular foundation made of lava stones for a hut shelter they found in the same archaeological bed where Homo habilis bones were found. Okay, so this is talking about the stone hut, Gunter's stone hut, the one that they mentioned in the video. This is the very first citation specifically about this on their website with easily clickable links. So this would have been the first citation that I went to. So let's go check it out. What is citation 11 on this site? Scroll down to the bottom here, citation 11, uh, and here it is. Leakey, 1979, report on the excavations at Hyrax Hill, Nakuru, Kenya Colony, 1937 to 1938, Transactions of the Royal Society of South Africa. Well, now, wait a second, Gunter. This isn't Genesis Apologetics' uh, Genesis Impact on Homo habilis video, uh, the one that you said you found um, extremely well done, well researched, and while not without errors, raising many valid points against the mainstream view of evolution. Now, confusing these two sites is something that you've been very harsh on me for, right? Uh, you've you've called it careless, and you've said that, in particular, the most scathing. <laughs> of what you said. That confusing the two is so bad that it, it suggests that you're so careless in your research that you're guided by prejudice and bias and that maybe science really isn't your thing. But Gunter, that's what Genesis Apologetics did. So my error here was assuming that the citation that Genesis Apologetics uses in their webpage associated with the video, that all of those citations were actually talking about the, the same site, right? That they wouldn't talk about something and then cite a completely different site when discussing it. That was my error. I assumed too much of them. But it's also like I said to you in that email, Gunter, I don't study material culture. I study morphology and hominid evolution. Specifically, I focus on the hominoids prior to the hominin pan and split with an emphasis on primatology, paleoprimatology from my master's and leading up into my PhD studies, right? So when I heard about this site, what I did before this impromptu interview with Aaron is that I went to their site, went to their first source that talked about it, found that it referred to the wrong place, and to me, that was all she wrote. Now, what I should have done is gone to every single one of their citations. That would have been the most complete way to assess Genesis Apologetics' specific argument here, one wrong argument out of dozens, um, but I actually figured out why I didn't do that as well, because when I went to go track down all these citations, the other ones specifically talking about the DK site, what I found is that I can't access any of them. I can't access the 1971 or 72 stuff, the Old Divide Bed 1 and 2 excavations uh, as outlined in a book published by Cambridge. I can't access Mary Leakey's Old Divide Gorge in Search of Early Man, not through my library, like my university library, not through my public library, not at my actual department in our little personal library there. I can't get it through any science hub. I can't purchase PDFs of any of it. And so the only option is to buy a physical copy, some of which go for more than $200. So I settled on placing a request for an interlibrary loan, and we will see if my library can get a hold of it in the next several days. But this video is probably going to come out before then, so I'm happy with just saying maybe if Genesis Apologetics didn't want somebody saying that they made a Hyrax Hill argument, they shouldn't have cited Hyrax Hill as their first citation about the stone circle itself. Um, psych? My interlibrary loan came in, and as you can see, this is an original copy of Old of I Gorge by Mary Leakey, specifically looking at Beds 1 and 2, originally published in 1971-1972. The things I do for you people. As you can see, this bad boy came all the way from New Mexico, so, you know, it came a long way to feature in this very video. And um, the reason I'm looking like this and the reason this video didn't come out when I wanted it to come out is because I accidentally released the other one first. It was not on purpose. So I guess, you know, in the end, God really does prefer me to you, Gunter, because I accidentally delayed the release and then this came in and I think you're really gonna like what we found inside. 
So first I'd like to point you to the back of the book, our, our index here, where stone circle, which is right here, right there, yeah, stone circle, is mentioned like less than six times. Not, not gonna get me this time, Gunter, seven times. It's mentioned seven times approximately. So already we're, we're not looking good given the size of this tome as far as the importance of the stone circle goes. But I also wanna point out the reason why I couldn't actually find and reproduce that map that Genesis Apologetics got a hold of is because on Google Books, when you look up this text, it says that the map is located in, in the pocket. And I was like, what is the pocket? And apparently old texts like this, especially if they're excavations, they come with a pocket that is filled with gigantic maps. My goodness, that's a lot of maps. There's a lot of maps in this book in that pocket. And there's the little note that I want to make here on, on one of them. And that's kind of a circular formation too, huh? So here we are. Let's pull out our map here and I'll show it to you for all to see. Get this bad boy rolling. It's gonna echo a little, I'm sorry, but you're just gonna have to live with that. Uh, here it is. Here's the map of the DK site. I found it for you. Here it is a lot closer, like close enough so that you can actually read all of the text on the image. Looks a little bit different than that Genesis Apologetics one where the description of the figure is completely stripped. There's an added red circle to show you where the hut quote unquote is and blocks that supposedly show where the piles of rocks are. And this thing is so compressed, you can't read a single word on it. Shoot, that's so weird. I think it's undeniable that there's a circle there at the DK site, but I think we can all appreciate that circles appear a lot in nature. And the disparity of certain types of object found within versus outside the bounds of the stone circle don't strike me as particularly convincing because this area is pretty large. But I think we should just go and see what Mary Leakey has to say about this, because given all the hullabaloo about this stone circle, this stone hut given by Gunther and Genesis Apologetics, who are all citing the paleo expert Mary Leakey, why don't we just see what she says about it? In the single passage in this entire book on the stone circle, we see a rough description of the circle itself, the dimensions, things of that nature, followed by a, some thoughts, like of what Leakey thought of this particular site. She says, in general appearance, the circle resembles temporary structures often made by present day nomadic peoples who build a low stone wall around their dwelling to serve either as a windbreak or as a base to support upright branches, which are bent over and covered with either skins or grass. An example of such a temporary shelter made by the Okumbambi tribe of Southwest Africa is reproduced in plate three for comparison. Okay, so far so good. This is exactly what Genesis Apologetics said. This is exactly what Gunter said. Ooh. Uh-oh, oh, there's another paragraph after that though. Let's see what it says. In addition to the stones from which the circle was constructed and those in its vicinity, there were several hundreds of scattered pieces of basalt, particularly on the occupation level. In the view of the occurrence of similar unmodified stones at other Old One sites, it is likely that a proportion of these were introduced by man. She means genus homo when she says that, by the way. But the proximity of the basalt and the fact that the occupation floor actually rests on its surface in certain areas makes it impossible to know for sure whether these stones were introduced by hominid agency or whether they became detached by weathering. They have, therefore, not been included in the analysis of this industry. Let's cover all the mentions of the stone circle though, just to really cover our bases here. The next mention is on page 261 and says, it is probable that the stone circle at DK formed the base of a rough windbreak or simple shelter. The two factors that are most suggestive of an artificial structure, the small heaps of piled up stones that form a part of a circle, and the fact that occupation debris did not, occu did not occur excuse me, in comparable density within the circle and in the surrounding area. The stone circle and the distribution patterns of the debris on the three living floors described above, where little or no disturbance appears to have taken place after the camps were abandoned, suggests that some form of crude shelter was probably constructed at Oldowan and developed Oldowan living sites. This may well have been no more than a protective fence, but the existence of some factor affecting the horizontal diffusion of debris on the living floors is indicated. So here, Leakey is saying, look, we, we can't support it, like necessarily enough to give it an analysis, but we do feel that this is in fact a stone circle that is representative of some kind of living space, a home base, if you will, of some kind of hominin. But uh-oh, Gunter, 
Leaky says which hominin she thinks it is. Now remember, she just described the DK site as Oldowan or developed Oldowan specifically. So keep that in mind for this next passage here, where she says two of these at least must have supposedly been tool makers in reference to Homo habilis and Homo erectus uh, together making a trio with Zinjanthropus, who we now know as Paranthropus. She says, if Homo habilis is accepted as the maker of the Oldowan, and in the view of cumulative evidence, this seems to be an inescapable conclusion, then it would be reasonable to assume he was also responsible for the developed Oldowan. But I think that's an important passage to read because Leakey thinks that the stone circle is in fact a remnant of some kind of dwelling, as Gunter and Genesis apologetics have proposed. But unlike them, she doesn't think that the maker was Homo erectus and clearly points to Homo habilis as the maker of the shelter, whether we're looking at the Oldowan, the, the area directly in the DK site, or the developed Oldowan, which is slightly younger. Now, all of this is putting aside the fact that the DK site is not currently considered and has not been like universally considered a dwelling since the 1980s. But even if it was, it wouldn't belong to Homo erectus. And why is that? Because Homo erectus is found at the top of this entire list of sites, and the DK site is the very bottom of the ones covered in this text. The very bottom is where we find the stone circle, and the very bottom is where we find Homo habilis. We find Homo erectus at the top, the furthest, the furthest away it could possibly be from the stone circle. So let me just reiterate this one more time for the folks in the back and for Gunther, who is no doubt trying to not pay attention to anything that I say here. And for Genesis Apologetics, if Dan Biddle happens to have stumbled his way into all of this mess, the stone circle is not considered by most to be indicative of a dwelling. And contemporary papers that we'll be going over later in this video suggest natural origin from two different alternative hypotheses, although the best is that it's just the result of, of weathering, presumably because the substrate is heterogeneous or something like that. Gunter's going to get me on the vocabulary for that one. But even if it was a stone circle, it wouldn't be associated with Homo erectus. It would be associated with Homo habilis by hundreds of thousands of years. There is no way to warp what Leakey originally published or what anybody has published ever that situation, that site, the DK site, what is found there, into Homo erectus lived there and hunted Homo habilis. It is not doable. Only if you want to take a step into fantasy realm. And I'm glad I got this book by Interlibrary Loan. Remember, I always check. So I should have been more careful or I should have purchased the over $200 book on the subject, I should have actually looked and seen that for the most part, they are talking about the DK site. They just so happen to cite other things as well. And I should have just addressed that actual argument, despite the fact that they, they do some citation shenanigans there. That is true. And I can own that. But I can't help but notice that Probably my top two mistakes on this channel, this one and then the one with Jeffrey Tompkins' methodology, are at least in part because of the garbage way in which the young earth creationists are actually portraying their information. Tompkins using a more ancient version of BLAST to rerun analyses despite the fact that working more modern versions of BLAST were available, and Genesis Apologetics here citing a completely different location when talking about um, DK, the DK site at Olduvai Gorge, and also making that completely different location citation the first citation when discussing the stone circle itself. I actually think that both of these are pretty honest mistakes. I could have been more careful in both, but I also don't think that I was careless in either. But Gunther has an additional argument to this article. He, for one, of course, is very happy that I have used Hyrax Hill to characterize Genesis Apologetics' argument instead of just the DK site, which, you know, again, so did they, but he also makes an additional argument that I basically admit that these young earth creationists are correct, because if in fact you did have Homo habilis being predated upon by Homo erectus, and Homo erectus was the true maker of this stone hut at this two million approximately uh, year old age at the site, uh, that maybe young earth creationists would have a point. So I think we should get into that, because he, he quotes me directly on it, um, and I think it's important because we should also just discuss the site on its own. Like, on its own, what does the DK site tell us? Is Genesis Apologetics correct in their assessment? 
The answer, of course, is no, but let's give it a shot anyways. Cheeky incompetence. Gunther says, to document this stunning amount of cheeky incompetence and also a very surprising admission, I provide the transcripts with time codes from relevant parts of the video by Aaron Ra and Gutsik Gibbon together with comments, but you really should watch the video passages afterwards to have a good laugh. So first he quotes me um, saying they don't look at the skulls, they obfuscate and talk about these stone huts. Uh, that again we're going to get to, so it's remarkably frustrating. And Gunther, instead of like picking up the slack of Genesis Apologetics and talking about the craniodental and postcranial characteristics of Homo habilis, uh, he says, yes, it is remarkably frustrating. How you are going to get to the point of the stone huts wrong? How are you going to get the point of the stone huts wrong? Um, that's, that's what he's upset about here. Except for Gunther, the videos on Homo habilis, not the stone huts, right? So they're obligated to talk about Homo habilis, like the morphology as well. That's also the, you know, the main reason why it's proposed to be a transitional species. After showing a snippet of the movie, which poses a question of whether the stone tools were used by or on Homo habilis, Gutsik Gibbon comments, Okay, so first and foremost, how do we know that the stone tools are being used on something or by something, right? Because you have Homo habilis at the site and you have a bunch of animals at the site and some of the animal bones have cut marks on them. So the point that I'm making here is that you find cut marks on animal bones, you don't find any cut marks on Homo habilis, and Homo habilis is the only thing at the site, at this particular strata in, in bed one here, like capable of using tools. So it serves to reason Homo habilis was the tool user. Um, and to that, and I even say this is the easiest sort of association that you can make. The guy capable of using tools found at the site was probably using the stone tools on the organisms that have cut marks on them, processing, butchering them, etc. And Gunter says, fair enough, but this ignores three major points. He said many more animal bones have been found at this locality than Homo habilis bones, so when only a fraction of all the bones have preserved cut marks, then it's statistically much more likely to find animal bones uh, with cut marks. So Gunter, there are no Homo habilis bones at that site with cut marks on them though. You have a bunch of other taxa that have cut marks, none of Homo habilis, and of all the taxa that don't have cut marks, only Homo habilis is capable of using tools. So thank you for missing that particular point um, in the section above. Cut marks are mostly found on long bones, but only a few long bones of Homo habilis have been found. This is also true, but you do find cut marks on non-long bones as well, right? So if the butchery was being done on Homo habilis, you would probably find some indication of it. Because if an animal is being butchered, you tend to find the cut marks on the long bones and also on other areas. For instance, cracking open the skull to get at the, the brain inside, uh, the vertebral column, things like that. And three, meanwhile, hominin long bones with cut marks from this time and region have indeed been identified at the Homo habilis locality of Kubifora in Kenya. I reported on this in another Fossil Friday article. This omission would arguably be excusable as the publication of the new study overlaps with the time of the making of Aaron Ra's video. So, um, okay, Gunter, do you think you're clever with this? Do you think that no one is going to notice what you've done here? So let's keep in mind the, the train of thought that, that Gunter's got in this little in this little section. So he's trying to make the argument that the Homo habilis bones are potentially the butchered instead of the butcherer and that the one who could have done this would have been like Homo erectus or something like that, just to remind you. And the support that he provides for this when I make the argument that no, Homo habilis was probably the butcherer because none of the Homo habilis bones have cut marks on them and it's the only thing at the site in this bed that was capable of using tools, he says, well, you know, maybe we just didn't find the Homo habilis remains with the cut marks on them. After all, Homo habilis is mostly represented by craniodental remains and usually cut marks are on long bones. So, you know, the, the Homo habilis remains could have been butchered. Maybe we just have zero evidence for it. After all, and then he says in his third point here, we find hominin long bones with cut marks on them from this time and region, and they've been identified at a Homo habilis locality, specifically Kubifora in Kenya. The obvious point here, right? The obvious inference is that he is suggesting that this long bone with the cut marks from a Homo habilis locality belonged to Homo habilis, right? He cites Pobiner uh, et al. 2023, uh, and then he says, well, maybe they've got the benefit of the doubt for, for not knowing this because it came out uh, so, so recently. But um, so Gunter, it's like I said in the email to you, that tibia with the cut marks doesn't belong to Homo habilis. So let's do a quick hop over to the, the article itself. So here we are at Pobiner et al. Uh, 2023, and we're discussing a tibia that has some cut marks on it, suggesting, suggesting that it's been butchered, or stone tools have been used on it at some point to, to pull meat off of it. 
Canem ER 741 was originally attributed to Paranthropus boisei, a robust australopith, when it was first published by Richard Leakey, and then described by Leakey and colleagues. Two decades later, Alan Walker revisited the taxonomic attribution of this specimen and put it in Homo erectus, based off of comparison to Canem WT 15,000, the Turkana boy. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is it has never been identified as Homo habilis. Now, to Gunter's credit here, they do say the entry about Canem ER 741 in the Encyclopedia of Human Evolution says that the current allocation is Homo erectus or an unknown hominin because so little is known about the tibial morphology of early hominins other than Australopithecus afarensis, so it may be premature to rule out the possibility it belongs to Homo habilis or Paranthropus boisei. But due to the taxonomic uncertainty of the fossil, we simply refer to it as a hominin in this uh, in this article. And the age of the fossil is estimated to be 1.45 million years ago. The point here, of course, is that it has never been identified as Homo habilis, even though uh, one of the sources here allows for the possibility that it's Homo habilis or Paranthropus boisei or Homo erectus, right? So it could be a number of different things. But I actually think that we can appeal to some of the stratigraphy of Kubifora to get our most likely answer and to understand why it is most commonly attributed to Homo erectus. So for Gunter here, I've pulled up the Kubifora Wikipedia page, which coincidentally has a series of taxa over here along with what they're dated to um, and, and what was found with the accession number. So we have Australopithecus anamensis at 4.2 to 3.9, Paranthropus boisei at 2.1 to 1.1. Now remember that tibia was found, or that tibia was dated to about 1.45 million years ago. So it couldn't be anamensis. It could potentially be Paranthropus boisei. Homo habilis, ooh, 1.9 to 1.6. Couldn't be Homo habilis. Homo rudolfensis, 1.9 to 1.6, couldn't be that either. Or Homo ergaster from 1.8 to 1.4. Homo ergaster is included in Homo erectus sensu leto. So based off of the stratigraphy and, and description of the site, it couldn't be Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, or Australopithecus anamensis, which is why it's most commonly been uh, given the taxonomic status of Paranthropus boisei, or Homo erectus sensu leto. So um, Gunter, what you've done here, that's real sneaky, and I would say borderline dishonest, at least certainly without elaboration. So that's really a big stone in a glass house, isn't it, Gunther? Maybe even a lava stone that, that makes up some kind of a stone hut formation. He goes on to say another snippet from the movie, talks about a 12-foot circular hut formation, that basically that it looks a lot like um, the, the modern day nomadic people hut formations that we see. Now, let's be really clear about what is actually at this site, right? At the DK site, we have a bunch of piles of rocks and the argument that was initially made by Genesis Apologetics, which is just parroting a soft suggestion by Mary Leakey from the 1970s, is that maybe these rock piles are used to uh, support like poles in the ground for like a windbreak or something along those lines, because that's what modern people groups do. Except, you know, this is almost two million years old. So that's the argument. It's not like you're finding anything definitive of a stone hut. And in fact, we'll talk in a little bit about what the what the current consensus is on this formation and what it actually has been since the 1980s. So here's what I say. He quotes me again. You'll notice that the, when they say that the circular hut is nearby, so we're talking about the distance between Olduvai Gorge and Hyrax Hill. Hyrax Hill is where they find these stone huts. That's everything I could find on them, is that these stone huts are, were found by Mary Leakey, who later says, uh, who later they say is the one who did the work on these stone structures or circular structures, and she did her work at Hyrax Hill. That's where they're from. And then he says, nope, that's not even remotely where they're from. As already mentioned, the stone circle was clearly described from bed one at Old Divide Gorge, and Gutsy Gibbon is confusing this with something totally different because she did not bother to look at the sources provided in the movie and its accompanying website. Gunter, that's where I got the source from. Nor did she bother to just watch the movie and listen to the argument more carefully. Um, and then they talk about how Aaron interrupts here, and I'm going to let Aaron speak for himself because I believe we're, we're all actually planning on getting together uh, and, and having a discussion about this very article in the attitudes of Gunter Beckley. Uh, but he says what um, what Aaron says is total rubbish. It's just two clueless YouTubers making up stuff because they only hear what they want to hear and are unable to research the facts. Wow, are those stones heavy. 
Gunther, in this massive glass mansion that you found yourself in. Gutsy Gibbon responds with a real howler, and it's just more me suggesting that it's Hyrax Hill, uh, which again, they cite. Now, you know, I'm, I'm confident about this, more confident than I should have been, uh, but again, I, I don't feel that it was a careless mistake. I feel like I, it was more like I could have been more careful. Oh boy, yes, Hyrax Hill is an eight-hour drive away because you looked at the wrong locality. Yes, um, they did too, Gunther. And Gutsick Gibbon, a PhD, student, a PhD student in anthropology, says she is always noticing because she always checks. This is hilarious. Yeah, I did check, and they cited the wrong location as well. The evidence that this is from Olduvai Gorge was plain to see in the slides and in the movie. They even quote Leaky 1979 as a reference, not Leaky 1943. They're talking about an Iron Age site that was discovered 30 years earlier by Leakey at Hyrex Hill. This is shockingly embarrassing. The university system has definitely failed these guys. Um, talking about a site that was not actually the primary site in the Genesis Impact video was definitely a mistake, even if it was listed in their citations without elaboration. But I really do think Gunter is overstating his case here, and he's being pretty smug about it, which is bold for someone who makes so many mistakes in all these little blog posts, again, as, as we will go over a little bit more later, and as other YouTubers have, have covered with regard to Gunter Beckley before. But like, Gunter's also talked to me, and presumably he's seen some of my other content, so I don't know how he can kind of mentally square what I've said here, like in the Genesis Impact video with my other content, and, and say that on the whole, the university system has failed me, right? Like that seems like a really big overstep in order to sound more confident. And um, I, I think that it's really going to continue to come back and bite him in the butt because uh, he's he's made quite um quite a, an enemy of me, I think. Uh, you know, it's a little LARPy to say, but like, I don't like Gunter Beckley anymore. I was at least neutral with him, but now I kind of hate the guy. I don't hate him. I just dislike him a lot. But I think I've shown here on my channel and in most other locations with almost everything I do that I'm pretty diligent with my citations. I'm pretty diligent with what I quote. Whenever I go over papers, we go over them in depth. And I think I have shown as well that I have some pretty in-depth on-the-fly knowledge when it comes to things like hominin evolution, even though that isn't my like particular study area. So Gunter, this is also just mean in addition to being like boldly incorrect. Uh, it's, it's mean. You hurt my feelings, but that's okay, because I will take your reputation, at least amongst my viewers, as a penance. I don't believe in the glorification of murder. I do believe in the empowerment of women. So getting back to uh, Beckley's article here, first what he does is double down. He says that he completely agrees with what <laughs> Genesis Apologetics uh, has to say with regard to the site. He says it here, I totally agree and make the same point in my earlier articles and he links them. That'll be important for later. He quotes me again talking about it being an Iron Age site, which again, I can own my mistakes. I always try to on this channel. Can Gunter? I guess we'll see. Time will tell. Uh, and then he says, Gutsy Gibbon goes on to make another irrelevant point, that even young Earth creationists accept radiometric dating as a relative dating in terms of older and younger, so that even internally, the argument that the sewn circle is older than Homo habilis would not work. Again, irrelevant because it is a different site, which is not Iron Age and not younger, but older than the Homo habilis bones. So the argument is perfectly valid and even supported by the evidence, which she will later admit. Now hold on here just a second, because the oldest Homo habilis remains that we have are at least 2.4 million years of age, right? More likely 2.8. So the fact, the idea that the stone circle is older than Homo habilis is abysmally incorrect. That point still stands, whether we're talking about the DK site or the Hyrax Hill site. Um, so again, he, he says that he wants to dunk a little bit on uh, Aaron Ra. Again, I'm going to let Aaron defend himself here. Uh, we, he busts my chops again, still talking about the Iron Age site. Um, and then we get to the section, not nonsense, but a fact. Nope, it's not nonsense, but a fact that the stone circle was found close temporally and geographically to Homo habilis. This is true. Actually, at the very same place and in the very same archaeological bed as the holotype OH7, even a bit below in the layers. Yes, but not older than all of Homo habilis, the species. And you don't need a university association to track down obscure publications from the 1930s. Uh, actually, you need something more extreme than a university uh, affiliation to find the other citations in the Genesis Apologetics webpage to find that 1971 uh, and 1979 uh, material. 
unless you want to pay hundreds of dollars on Amazon, which I told Gunther via email. Everybody can Google the facts in a few seconds. What a joke! And it is made worse by their mean-spirited insinuations. Again, all of those mean-spirited insinuations in that Homo habilis video, Gunther, are because I had spent right, the past several sessions with Aaron going over the minutia of other hominin claims made by Genesis Impact in a video that is, again, based off of Contested Bones, a book that I have read numerous times and annotated to hell and back that is so egregiously wrong on everything it says with regard to hominins that it is effectively criminal. Again, I'm being hyperbolic, so don't take that too seriously. And this is material that you have gone ahead and given at least your partial seal of approval to. So it's not completely based. In fact, it's like 99.9% .9 not based on this hut material, but instead everything else that they went on to say. R and Ron Guts and Gibbon definitely owe a sincere apology to the makers of the Genesis Impact movie and an apology to their own audience that, have, that they have been misinformed and misled by their video. I won't hold my breath, though. This is the same thing that Robert Carter has said about me, or that he did before I owned my mistake with Jeffrey Tompkins, with his methodology at least initially. I am always happy to admit that I'm wrong. Again, I try to make that part of my brand, if you will, because I think it's so important to be able to do and so important to fix your mistakes. Uh, not that Gunther Beckley would have any experience with that, at least not that I've seen, but no, I don't owe any kind of apology to Genesis Apologetics. This would be like if a criminal had a hundred counts of murder against them and you found that only 99 of them were true. They're still a murderer. And to make matters worse, even that last one, the Stone Hut situation, is still incorrect for reasons that we're going to talk about in a moment. So it's actually just still 100 out of 100, but much like the Tomkins situation, uh, just in a different way than I had initially thought. So I'd like to detour now and actually sink my teeth into the argument as it stands about the Old of IDK bed one stone huts. What does the current literature think about it? What does the literature think uh, is responsible for making it? Or who maybe even is responsible for making it? Because this is going to be important for some of the many articles that uh, Gunter has actually written that we're going to go over later on in this video. So I would say first, let's go to the original publication by Mary Leakey. But as I said previously, I can't get a hold of it right now. Like I, I just do not have access to it. So we're going to have to do the next best thing and go to the next published source that I actually have access to uh, on the subject. And that's actually going to be a 1988 book on the uh, like hominid behavior at Olduvai. We used to call hominids hominids. It's like a whole thing. Uh, but it's titled Early Hominid Activity at Olduvai Gorge. And um, this, this, is our, this is our excerpt on the stone circle, on the stone hut from the book itself. So I'm going to read this little excerpt um, so we can see like <laughs> What, what the primary opinion was at the time in 1988. The final issue that must be considered concerns the evidence for shelters at Olduvai. A construction of a shelter may be viewed as a fundamental development of modern home base activity. The roughly circular arrangement of unmodified basalt rock, DK3, is thus an important matter to consider. The popular interpretation of this cluster of stones is that it formed the foundation of a shelter, making it the earliest known structure on an archaeological site. Campbell, 1982, Leakey, 1971. This interpretation is based on the similarity of the DK stone configuration to rings of stone that support grass huts in southern Africa today, and also to aboriginal hunting blinds in Australia. The basalt stones at the DK range in diameter from 5 to 20 centimeters, and at first glance would appear to be similar to the manuports introduced to the site by hominids. If this were the case, the arrangement of the DK3 stones would be difficult to explain other than by hominid activity. Although the DK locality shows the clearest taphonomic effect from water action of any at the Bedouin sites, the rocks forming the circle are too large to have been moved considerably by the degree of water apparent at the site. However, Two points stand in the way of the hominid activity interpretation. First, the basalt stones that make up the circle come from the basalt layer that lies directly below DK3 and that naturally protrudes through this horizon in various areas of the site. The irregular basalt rocks show no sign of hominid alteration and probably became detached from the layer below by weathering. And this is something that was actually proposed as a potential uh, explanation by Leakey herself in the original description of the site. An alternative hypothesis that has not been 
Hello, let's go down a little bit. An alternative hypothesis that has not been considered widely before is that the roughly circular arrangement of the stones may have been produced by a radial distribution of tree roots, known in more recent contexts to penetrate and break up bedrock. Only a few small stone flakes and bone fragments were found within the DK circle, and these could have been introduced to the site by water flow. Keep that water flow in mind, folks. In cases where there are not yet criteria to infer the causes of unique archaeological patterns, such as the DK stone circle, alternative taphonomic interpretations must be placed at least on equal footing to the ideas that stress hominid activity. And the second problem that they state, that Pott states here, is the uniqueness of the stone circle in the archaeological record, since like the, the next one is from 300,000 years ago. So, what Potts is arguing here is that potentially this stone circle is not the result of hominid activity, but rather natural processes involving water flow. So let's look at one of the uh, next like papers that we have on this subject, and that's this one by Stana Street from uh, 2018, titled Lahair Inundated Modified and Preserved 1.88 Million Year Old Hominin OH24 and OH56 uh, at the DK site. So let's let's see what we got. In the body of this piece, we see the authors discuss a little bit on the nature of the formation of the stone circle. We speculate that the DK stone circle may have represented an area situated on a high on a basalt high under a shade tree, al already recognized as a possible factor in localizing Olduvai accumulations by Potts in 1986. A shade tree might additionally have acted as a refuge when necessary. For example, trees that would likely root in the cracks and joints produced in the basalt are the straggler fig or other fig trees, which would have provided a food resource, as well as areas of shady cover of at least 10 meters across, compared to the 5.5 diameter reported by the stone circle. We accept that some of the more angular rubble at the site may have been generated when such a tree was uprooted, as suggested by Potts in 1984. So basically the idea is that it's a natural refuge, perhaps covered by a tree, and Potts made the argument that the tree roots are what's actually disturbing a lot of that uh, basaltic layer, like turning it up, um, churning it up with their root systems, as it were, and that flow from that high point is what gave us this sort of radial halo arrangement of uh, debitage, bones, and rocks below this area. Um, not a stone hut, actually, believe it or not. So this is what we see. Here's their diagram. And I actually appreciated this diagram because they note here that this is a reproduction of Leaky 1971 made available by De La Torre because I assume they couldn't get the original figure, much like I can't get the original figure because it's impossible to get a hold of. So as it stands with regard to this Genesis Impact video, this site, the DK site, I inappropriately conflated with the Hyrax Hill site. This is something the Genesis Apologetics also did. But if we hone in on the DK site itself, which is dated to like 1.9 million years of age, it's found below Homo habilis remains, and that's what Beckley and Genesis Impact used to argue that Homo habilis couldn't have made this stone structure, right? We actually have older Homo habilis remains just elsewhere, so it actually is still possible that Homo habilis made this stone hut structure at least as likely as Homo erectus sensu leto. Uh, but most importantly of all, it's probably not a stone hut structure. It's probably naturally formed, and this has been the opinion since Potts 1988. So I'm not sure why Gunter Beckley is so gung-ho about this being a stone hut, like, that was clearly made by Homo erectus, when neither of those points can be shown to be the case with any degree of confidence. And that's probably why everyone who cites it cites the original leaky 1971 paper, huh? Gunter Beckley continues, saying, They play another snippet from the movie where the portrayed scientist admits that the stone hut foundations beneath Homo habilis represent a very good point. Gutsy Gibbon actually agrees with this, and this is the most important passage in the whole video, so, so let's quote me here. This is incredibly sneaky, right, what they've done here. Because if that were true, if you could actually show categorically constructed stone monuments as being earlier than any finding of Homo habilis, that would be a very interesting point to make. That would be a good point in the sense that it would merit further investigation, but that's not what they found. It's simply not. It's like brutally untrue, you see what I mean? So like, yeah, it categorically is a good point, just like it would be a good point if we found a rabbit side by side with a trilobite, right? Like, yeah, that's a good point, except that never happened. It's not even close. It's just a lie. Like, I mean, there's not much else to say, except, yeah, you would have a good point in fantasy world, right? Here's what Gunter says in response to that. Because I want to make something 
pretty clear here that is completely going to go over Gunter's head. What I said was, if you could show constructed stone monuments as being earlier than any finding of Homo habilis, this entire statement, Gunter, applies to the DK site still, now, even adjusting, like taking the, the Iron Age formation completely out of the equation, this still applies. Because that stone site is dated to 1.9 million years ago, and the oldest Homo habilis is at least 2.4 million years of age, probably 2.8. So, you goober, this still is the case. This is a valid argument that, because you don't know your hominins, went completely over your head. You completely bombed it, Gunter. Well done. He says, wow, we caught you now and will not let you get away with this unnoticed and will disclose and preserve it for posterity. Thank you, Gunter, for etching in stone, the internet being our eternal repository for knowledge here, your blunder. Anthropologist Gutsit Gibbon just explicitly and unequivocally admitted that such stone circles would be a good point, an interesting and valid argument if they were true. Since it is demonstrably true, not fantasy or lie, it will be interesting to watch how Arn Ron guts it given try to whitewash this or move the goalposts or more likely cover up their incompetence, especially their dangerous admission. Gunter, are you like, are you like bad with reading comprehension, right? In addition to not knowing the dates of your hominins? Because again, the statement that you just reproduced here still applies to the DK site. Because the DK site is 2 million years old, giving you 100,000 years on the other end there. And Homo habilis is older than that. And what I said was, if that was true, that you could show categorically that constructed stone monuments are older than any finding of Homo habilis, that would be an interesting point to make. I'm assuming you had to type this up or copy and paste it. So you, you should have read this at least a few times, uh, and yet you bungled it. So that's phenomenal. Let's see if you, you admit that. As, as you uh, assume that I can't admit my mistakes, I'm going to assume that you can't admit yours. But unlike you, I will be happy to be surprised because I'm not a mean person like you are. I'm being aggressive to you because you acted like a jackass first. Now add to their complete blunder on the science, the sneering mockery about the stupid creationists, the scornful laughter about their assumed ignorance, and the arrogant, condescending, patronizing style. This simply cried out to be exposed by me. Oh goodness, the vigilante for science comes stumbling his way through this article, making mistake after mistake after mistake. Wow, you truly are something special, Gunter. The hero that the Discovery Institute deserves. Honestly, you should be mortified by this. You should be absolutely embarrassed by this pathetic display at slam dunking someone else, all the while just botching it at every possible opportunity. It should be studied. He says, sorry, Gutsig Gibbon, but these creationists got it right, and you proved to be clueless about your own field and a sloppy researcher as well. You're going to get struck by lightning saying shit like this, Gunter. Seriously, I, I kind of can't believe it that you managed to do exactly what you're accusing me of, not once, but like dozens of times over the course of your multiple blog posts and several times in this very article. It really is something uh, incredible to behold. Um, and I'm quite lucky that that you managed to, uh, to goof so hard in pointing out an error that I made. Um, anyways, he, he dunks on Aaron again here. He's mad about Aaron. And he finishes it with this. And, and Jackson Wheat actually tweeted this out the other day, and, and it's what spurred um, all of us to get together and, and have a little chat about this, which we're going to do in a few days. Unfortunately, poorly researched and highly biased content, mixing factoids with outright falsehoods, more motivated by a dogmatic worldview than any interest in scientific truth, is symptomatic for the new generation of atheist and materialist, hardcore Darwinist YouTubers, such as Arn Raw, Gutsit Gibbon, Jackson Wheat, Dapper Dinosaur, or Professor Dave, and their deplorable ilk. Yeah, I admit it. This case of ignorant chutzpah really steamed me. So enough ranting for today. Fortunately, you have evolution news and other media that bring you real science and debunk the debunkers. Well, I'm actually not an atheist, a materialist, or a Darwinist. So again, showing us that you really did your research. Huh, Gunter Beckley. In fact, that actually applies to a lot of the other individuals that you've mentioned. I also, and I noted this to other people who I affiliate with a lot, 
noticed that you didn't include any of the uh, of the PhDs who also rail against the Discovery Institute. And I think that's because you're you're trying to make it seem as though it's this really weird fringe group of um, uneducated, inappropriately trained individuals with no relevant expertise on YouTube who are coming after you guys, when in reality, it's just the entire scientific community. This was a snide and pitiable piece by Gunther Beckley that, for the most part, was wrong more frequently than it was right. It was rude, it was mean-spirited, and uh, inaccurate, of course. So, incomplete, selective, ignorant, that's how I described it initially, and I think that holds. But believe it or not, that actually holds for most of Gunter Beckley's material that he puts out on his blog, just across the board. So let's take a look at some of the other times that he's talked about hominin evolution on the Gunter Beckley side of evolution news and see how he, uh, how he does in other areas, shall we? In this article by Beckley, another Fossil Friday titled Another Prediction Vindicated, as if Gunter is just vindicating ID all the time, he discusses that Pobiner 2023 um, cut marks on the tibia. So you can see it, there are those little cut marks. Um, I suspect they're probably cut marks, although you should know that this was decently controversial when it came out. So he recounts the entire situation. Yet again, we see a lot of quotations uh, from that we already saw, like in the, the previous article that we saw. And this is this is like chronologically earlier. This is from last year. Uh, but specifically, I want to focus on the stuff that, again, he just like boldly got wrong. So first, this time, he only cites the Encyclopedia of Human Evolution that said that it was an unknown species identification and allowed for the possibility of Homo habilis. And of course, he doesn't talk about uh, the Pobiner et al. quote that said that it's been previously assigned to Homo erectus and Paranthropus boisei. But then, even better, down here, when discussing the actual, like, potential species that this tibia belongs to, again, it was previously assigned to Paranthropus boisei and Homo erectus, but never Homo habilis due in part to the time period in which it was found. He says, even though the fossil is slightly younger than the youngest known finds of Homo habilis, it is still contemporary. It is still contemporary with other ape-like hominins of the genera Australopithecus and Paranthropus. So yes, uh, here Gunther is admitting that this tibia is not contemporaneous. It would make it like the, the youngest known Homo habilis. It's not contemporaneous with any other known uh, Homo habilis remains. He says, considering the taxonomic uncertainty, the bone most likely belonged to an Australopithecine-like Homo habilis than to a contemporary member of genuine Homo erectus or Homo ergaster who could have been the hunter. Now, how exactly are we linking these? two things here, because to me, this is just an assertion. Yet again, Gunther is not supporting his case whatsoever. He's like, yeah, I think it was probably Homo habilis, because that would mean I could say that it was hunted by Homo erectus, and we could put a greater distance between early members of genus Homo, like Homo habilis, or Homo uh, rudolfensis and the later uh, Homo erectus sensuleto, despite the fact that there is, as I said earlier, extreme morphologic overlap between those two groups and indeed between Homo habilis and the earlier Australopiths. Let's look at the next article. Gunter's next article is another Fossil Friday titled To Be or Not To Be Homo, as in a member of genus Homo. So he starts off again describing the history of Homo habilis um, and he talks about how there's controversy in the assignment to genus Homo, and he cites Anne Gibbons, who has a, a piece that is describing the history of the placement of Homo habilis, and Casey Leskin, who is another intelligent design advocate who works at the Discovery Institute and not a paleontologist or paleoanthropologist. So then they talk about uh, Ian Tattersall, who's previously described Homo habilis as a wastebasket taxon. Uh, this is from 1992. This was before we got a lot of um, more in-depth descriptions for um, actually binning some of these early members of genus Homo as something distinct from Homo erectus sensuleto and late members of Australopithecus. And he goes on to say Homo habilis was certainly not the ancestor of later Homo species because he is too recent and coexisted with early Homo ergaster, thus leaving a distinct gap between between Australopithecines and genus Homo. And he cites uh, an article by John Hawkes and colleagues, a paper by John Hawkes and colleagues who have historically wanted the origin of genus Homo to be in South Africa rather than East Africa, uh, which is where most of the Homo habilis remains are found. Now, what I'll say is that what, what Beckley has said here uh, is incorrect. Homo habilis is certainly not the ancestor of later Homo species because he is too recent and coexisted with early Homo ergaster, leaving a distinct gap between Australopithecines and genus Homo. This is simply false, right? We have overlap between hominins, like from Homo sapiens all the way back 
to like Ardipithecus ramidus. So the case here is that we have older Homo habilis, like we have Homo habilis remains that are older than any member of Homo erectus sensuleto, right? The oldest stuff that could potentially be attributed to Homo erectus is 2 million years of age. And that's if that Dremelin material is correct. Other than that, the oldest material um, is going to be, like of genus Homo, is going to be Homo habilis at 2.4, or if we accept Lady Gararu, 2.8 million years ago. So it is actually possible that you have like a habiline type ancestor to Homo erectus, right? You would have peripatric speciation. This isn't that difficult of a concept to understand, but I suppose it is for someone who refuses to read any uh, evolutionary biology literature with regard to the hominids. So he says, since its small brain fall volume falls within the range of the Australopithecine, several scientists very early doubted the attribution of Homo habilis to genus Homo. Also, the hand and feet are more ape-like and exhibit clear adaptations for climbing. So remember when we discussed earlier that Homo habilis overlaps with both Homo erectus and Suleto and the Australopiths. That is why it is a problematic species to intelligent design advocates like Gunter Beckley here. He cites Walter and Shipman here, Walker and Shipman, excuse me, here uh, in 1996, saying that Homo habilis is even more ape-like than Lucy, as well as Spore 1994, remarking in their comparative study of hominid labyrinthine morphology since the inner ear, uh, that specimens of STW53 provisionally attributed to Homo habilis differs from all other hominids and shows greatest similarities to the patterns observed for large cercopithecoids, which suggests that STW53 relied less on bipedal behavior than the Australopithecines. And then he cites Holly Smith, who concluded from comparative studies of hominid patterns of dental development that the gracile Australopithecines and Homo habilis remain classified with African apes. And then classically, he cites Wooden Collard, who have always been the ones who say, put Homo habilis in Australopithecus, but as we discussed earlier, they do that strictly on the basis of an adaptive regime, aka behavior, not morphology. Now, of the rest of these citations, this first one by Walker and Shipman, this is from a book that I, I read quite some time ago. I don't actually own it though. And I believe, if memory serves, that they're talking about the limb ratios here, which is true. Homo habilis does have longer um, arms compared to the legs than, than Lucy actually does. Spore, we'll look at here in a moment because um, STW53 is not currently considered to be Homo habilis, but rather a more primitive member of genus Homo, Homo gautengensis. Holly Smith here specifically looked at dental development, saying that Homo habilis's dentition looked more like Australopithecus than it does like Homo. This is also non-controversial. So back to Spore here, because there's there's an important little bit that, that Spore discusses with relation to OH7 that has implications on what Holly Smith just said, which is that when you're looking at the mandibular remains of OH7, it looks a lot like Australopithecus. The reconstructed mandible is remarkably primitive, with a long and narrow dental arcade more similar to Australopithecus afarensis than to the derived parabolic arcades of Homo sapiens or Homo erectus. We find that the shape variability is not consistent with a single species of early Homo, so basically Homo erect or uh, Homo rudolfensis and Homo habilis uh, are unique individuals. But in this same paper, looking at that same specimen, we reconstructed the parietal bones of OH7 and estimated its endocranial volume at between 729 and 824 um, milliliters, or so our cc's here. It is larger than any previously published value and emphasizes the near complete overlap in the brain size among species of early Homo. Our results clarify the Homo habilis hypodyne, but raise questions about phylogenetic relationships. So take Taken together, all of these citations that um, that Beckley has here, we see that Homo habilis is intermediate. It has a larger brain case size by quite a bit on its higher end than any of the Australopiths, but the teeth are still really primitive. Uh, Beckley knows about these points and talks about them a little bit later in this blog post, talking about how it was suggested by some that Homo habilis should be transferred to Australopithecus, but rejected because on the whole, it looks more like genus Homo than it does Australopithecus, especially taking post remains into account. Um, and then he talks about Spore 2015, which is that paper I just showed you. I was supposed to be showing you an earlier Spore um, paper, but they, you know, same guy, they converge on the same general idea. Uh, and he says that he found the mandible of Homo habilis is remarkably more primitive and similar to Australopithecus afarensis and reconstructed a slightly larger brain volume for the holotype and clarified the dentition um, of genus or of uh, Homo habilis, but cautioned that these results raise questions. Um, then Beckley says, 
This is very much contradicting Darwinian expectations that the oldest specimens of Homo habilis, such as the 2.3 million year old specimen AL666-1, possess more advanced characteristics than the younger holotype specimen, which lived more than half a million years later. Does he think it's anagenetic? Because I don't think anybody has proposed that in decades, which is concerning because Gunter, you're supposed to be a paleontologist. One of the most striking contradictions is the fact that the bones of Homo habilis and many other animals were found in the context of a so-called butchering site, together with stone tools and the neighborhood of rock circles that look very much like the stone huts used by modern nomadic tribes. These rock circles and huts demonstrably originated at the same time as Homo habilis, which obviously suggests that this ape-like creature was rather the animal prey of contemporary human hunters than the human ancestor and producer of stone tools. Gunter, what? You just cited a brain case size that was slightly larger, you know, one that overlaps with Homo erectus, the one who you're saying is butchering Homo habilis here. Why wasn't Homo habilis capable of being the butcherer? Exactly how are you proposing that that is the case? Because it has primitive mandibles? Is, is that the idea? Um, because last time I checked, you didn't need, like, advanced mandibles to, to construct stone tools. Right? So this is just Gunter simply asserting things again. Otherwise, we would have to believe the highly implausible hypothesis that an ape-like creature with an ape-sized brain, you just cited a source that says the opposite. Are you not reading your own sources? And climbing adaptations built stone huts like modern humans. Again, these are probably not even stone huts. Anyway, the majority of evolutionists, of course, ignored all such doubts among the experts and blindly embraced Homo habilis as a cherished missing link without asking inconvenient and potentially career-threatening questions. Everything has to be a conspiracy when you're an ID proponent. I suppose. So I I'd like to show you guys something really quick because this is going to be important for Gunther uh, and his nonsense moving forward. Here's a little diagram by uh, Batista um, et al. here, and I, I don't think it's from, I don't think that this individual is like a paleoanthropologist, but they actually do a really good job charting the evolution of brain case size in hominins. And what I really want you to appreciate is this section right here in the middle where we have uh, Australopithecus afarensis, Australopithecus africanus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus or ergaster, and all of these groups are overlapping right? Africanus overlaps with Habilis, Afarensis overlaps with Habilis, Habilis overlaps with the Ergaster slash Erectus, and Ergaster slash Erectus overlaps with Habilis. And you can look up any chart that has the, the detailed numeric CCs of all of these different species and see it for yourself. I talked about it earlier in this video, Gunter, they overlap. There is no clear distinction in brain case size between Australopithecus versus Homo habilis and Homo habilis versus Homo erectus sensu leto. You are up a creek with this concept. And it's made a lot worse by the fact that that lower end for Homo habilis brain case size is Canem ER1813, which is a full cranium. So this is the last article we're gonna cover, at least with regard to hominin origins by Gunter Beckley, but it's it's got a lot in it. We're gonna be uh, full after this one. It's titled Examining Professor Dave's Absurd Attack on Casey Luskin. And in this little article, Gunter is going to try to defend some of the incorrect statements that Casey Luskin has made. And I know those statements are incorrect because I actually helped Professor Dave with with that script as well, because Casey Luskin got a lot wrong. I'm sure he's great in his field, but he's not a paleoanthropologist, and incidentally, neither is Gunter. So Gunter spends a lot of this first part being mad about Dave Farina and Dave Farina's style. Again, Dave can defend himself. He doesn't need me for that. We're going to get right to where Gunter, uh, again, bungles the facts. So we start here in On the Merits, where Gunter says, for example, Farina says that the theory of evolution predicted that the human form should emerge slowly. Apparently, he is unaware of the distinct gap between the ape-like Australopithecines and our own genus Homo. This is reviewed in Luskin 2017. Yes, I know, and Luskin is incorrect in that. Don't believe me? Here's world-renowned paleontologist, paleoanthropologist John Hawks saying the same thing, and he cites a John Hawks article from 2000, the one that we already uh, saw him cite in an earlier, well, chronologically later blog post. In some, he quotes, the earliest Homo sapiens remains differ significantly from Australopithecines in both size and anatomical details. Insofar as we can tell the changes were sudden and not gradual. Okay, um, so pause here, because Gunter Beckley and Casey Luskin alike, to my understanding, accept, like most creationists do, that Homo erectus, at the very least, is an ancestor or ancestral form to Homo sapiens. So 
Yes, the difference between Homo sapiens and Australopiths is quite large. Well, since that Joan Hawkes paper was from 2000 and is missing, like, half of the hominins that we actually know of, why don't we go with something a little bit more recent from Australopithecus to Homo, the transition that wasn't, again, by Kimball and Vilmore from 2016. I think this might be elucidating for everyone, hopefully Gunther Beckley included. So we're going to skip all of this and go down to the conclusion. I've read from Australopithecus to Homo many times um, on this channel, and uh, I, I just want to hit you with the conclusion here. Gunther, you can pull out a piece of paper and a pencil and maybe take some notes here. The fossil record bearing on the ancestry of Pleistocene Homo is poor. However, the more we learn about early Homo, the less compelling is the case that an adaptive shift can be read from currently documented skull and skeletal anatomy as a major transition from generalized Australopithecus precursors. Early phylogenetically basal species Species of the Homo clade resemble generalized Australopiths more than they do later species of the clade, as expected from a Darwinian pattern of descent with modification. These and subsequent transitional species of the Homo lineage, e.g. Homo erectus, erode the impression of distinct adaptive suites created by comparisons between terminal taxa, you mean like Australopiths versus Homo sapiens, or those separated by large temporal gaps. The epigraph heading this paper indicates that Darwin himself recognized this as a probable outcome of descent with modification given a grown fossil record, you know, like one that has grown in 16 years. The argument has recently been updated by Cartmill um, 94, or Citation 94. This recognition is not, however, a pay-on to wholesale phylogenetic or gradual evolution in Homo, as we commonly asserted half a century ago. The African fossil record of Homo demonstrates diversity quite clearly between 2 and 1.7 million years ago, and there are hints of it as far back as 2.4 million years ago. It is, rather, an argument against adaptive unity as a biological necessity adjunct to mono in the definition of the genus category. Whether or not we choose to adopt a large number of super-specific taxonomic ranks and their associated taxon names dictated by a bushy hominin clade is not a pressing scientific matter in the quest to understand human origins. Of greater importance can be counted the recent arguments for the use of the manufacture of stone tools in time periods predating by some half a million years the earliest homo fossils known. He's talking about the Lamequi tool site, which is associated with either Australopithecus or Kenianthropus, which Gunther does not clearly discriminate between. He thinks of them as both, like, just basic apes. And the potential they have to shrink the adaptive space between Homo and Australopithecus still further, indeed. And listen closely to this one, Gunther. Indeed, the expanded brain case size, human-like wrist and hand anatomy, dietary eclecticism, and potential tool-making capabilities of the generalized Australopiths root the Homo lineage in ancient hominin adaptive trends, suggesting that the transition from Australopithecus to Homo may not have been very much of a transition at all. Oh, shoot. You know, Gunther, I'm beginning to think that maybe you can't actually make the case that Australopithecus and Homo are categorically different without using sources that are over a dozen years out of date or quote mining. There, there, let me get my tissues. But hey, if you're Gunther Beckley thinking to yourself, that's a completely different opinion. So how about we see what John Hawkes, the leader of Gunther Beckley's primary supporting paper here, let's see what Hawkes has to say about this now. I actually got the chance to talk to John Hawkes as well at the ABAs this past um, this past weekend. So let's check his blog and see what he said about Homo habilis like in the past several years. Um, we have an article titled The Plot to Kill Homo habilis, which Let's let's see what he has to say. Um, there's some interesting stuff in here that, that I'm excited to share with you. Um, basically, he, he retells the history, talks about how they've got wooden collar on one side and a lot of um, sort of tra traditionalists on the other, uh, saying specifically here in green, most recently, fossil discoveries like Australopithecus sediba, Homo naledi, and Homo floresiensis have added whole skeletons of hominins who have skull shapes and teeth a lot like primitive Homo, but smaller brains than habilis. Together with a broader array of evidence attributed to Homo erectus, especially from Dimenisi, Georgia, such new fossils present a different story about the relationships within our genus. Basically, what he's saying is the adaptive regime that was once proposed by Collard and Wood doesn't fit with these new members of genus Homo, some of which are, are like, probably Homo erectus, Homo georgicus, if, if you want to be kind of, um, be kind of French with that. But scrolling down past all of the history and talking about how people have tried before to get Homo habilis's name changed right after this lovely picture where he says rushing to put all these different species into different genera is madness because, by the way, Wood and Collard do not actually think that Homo habilis should be an Australopith. Instead, most recently, what they've said is my sense is that Handyman should belong to its own genus. Neither Australopith nor human. Something in between, wouldn't you know it. 
It's really problematic assigning these hobbits to Homo when we're talking about something that's a meter tall with a tiny brain by hominin standards, Collard says. It's very difficult to see how that doesn't stretch the boundaries of genus Homo beyond what should be reasonable. And I certainly don't think that Gunther Beckley thinks that Homo floresiensis is a non-human. Most creationists don't, even ID proponents. So scrolling down, we get uh, Hawks' opinion on the adaptive grade from Wooden Collard. He says, old ideas about the adaptive grade can be surprisingly brittle in the face of new discoveries because, as I said, we've discovered quite a few new specimens, which begs the question, why is Gunter Beckley using all citations like pre-2015? The Cadenumu skeleton attributed to Australopithecus afarensis, first unearthed in 2005 from Veronzo Mille, Ethiopia, has a large body and long legs that are very different from the tiny Lucy skeleton. Its describers have argued that the skeleton shares many aspects of the human body plan. If they're correct, such features would not be special to true members of Homo, like Homo erectus. Um, and then they, they talk about Homo naledi, who also muddies the water. Um, at the end here, we, we, we see that Hawks concludes by saying there's no question that such evidence is changing scientific ideas about Homo and its origin. That's exactly why it would be a bad idea to publish a new genus name for Habilis. With a better fossil record, we should be raising the standard to rely upon the whole body of evidence. It's far too soon to be confident about the true relationship of hominins. We need to integrate the information from postcranial skeletons that have only recently emerged. Why in the world would we adopt a new name for an old species right now with the scientific process still unfolding? And why would we select some of the most fragmented fossils? Fossils is the basis for such a major re revision of hominin taxonomy. It's the wrong time to rename Homo habilis. So ah uh, shucks, Gunter, it looks like no one thinks that Homo habilis currently should be a member of Australopithecus, as you have repeatedly inferred over the course of many articles uh, that have been released in 2023, 2024, uh, and this one in 2022. So moving on, <laughs> Gunter Beckley gets mad that Dave Farina like criticized Casey Luskin's Science Unfolding or whatever it was called. It was called Science Uprising, that's it science uprising episode that like implies that the Lucy pelvis reconstruction was inaccurate. And I watched that video. It heavily implies that the reconstruction was, was inaccurate. It actually just shows they, they like cut out the original audio and like have these buzz saw sounds while they're talking about this reconstruction made from plaster as if to imply uh, that this was like a hack job done to force Lucy's pelvis into a human like shape with sagittally oriented ilia um, and like a bowl, uh, a bowl shape with a short ilia and short ischia as well. This is absolute nonsense, right? And one of the ways that we know this is the case, like that we know that the reconstruction was appropriate, is the fact that we found other Australopith pelvis since then, and they match Lucy's pelvis, like all the way down to the iliac flare in some specimens. So Gunter, that's ridiculous. Um, and he he barely holds to this at the end. He's like, who cares if Australopithecus did walk upright? It doesn't actually matter. But he does make a, a an effort here at defending Casey Luskin's proposition, his soft proposition that the reconstruction of Lucy may have been inaccurate. Specifically, Luskin's words were that uh, evolutionary interpretation and imagination played a role in the reconstruction. Gunter says, of course they did, which is demonstrated by the fact that experts disagreed on the interpretation of Lucy's hip and produced several different reconstructions. So let's talk about that, because he's got some citations here. Even though they were aware of the distortion in the fossil and of Lovejoy's reconstruction, which they note, Stern and Sussman in 1983, a famous paper, concluded in their study of Lucy's pelvis that the marked resemblance of AL2881 to the chimpanzee is equally obvious. Even allowing for postmortem distortion in the middle of the iliac crest, AL2881, uh, it is impossible to obtain an orientation comparable to humans. Okay, so let's go check that out because I've read the Stern and Sussman paper many times. I think it's really interesting the portion that Gunther decided to point out is where Stern and Sussman talk about the aspects of the Australopithecus pelvis that weren't derived, that were more basal, because I like this little bit in the conclusion that I think, you know, sums up their entire opinion instead of just picking one portion of the text as if it were a type of fruit, perhaps, perhaps a cherry of some sort. So in their conclusion here, they say, in our opinion, Australopithecus afarensis is very close to what can be called a missing link. It possesses a combination of traits entirely appropriate for an animal that had traveled well down the road towards full-time bipedality, but which retained structural features that enabled it to use trees efficiently for feeding, resting, sleeping, 
or escape. Prior to the discovery of the Hadar remains, one could not have predicted precisely what combination of traits would be found in the transitional form, such as Australopithecus afarensis. The more fossils that are found, the more we are surprised. Excitement builds for the discovery of specimens from four to six million year old in range. However, we may speculate that the that in a representative Australopithecus afarensis lineage from this time, we will not find a combination of arboreal and bipedal traits, but rather an anatomy of a generalized ape. The challenge we submit may lie in our ability to identify this ancestor as a hominid. And it's interesting how well this is played out, um, perhaps not from this time range, but from a little bit older. Uh, so Gunter, like, you know, why, why, why'd you pick the portion you picked? Hmm? Because um, Stern and Sussman agree that Australopithecus afarensis is bipedal on the ground. In fact, again, no one disagrees on this. Let's check out some of your other sources. Gunter's next citation comes from Burge et al. 1984, who presented their own reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis using the method of mirror modeling. They found characteristic human features as well as significant dissimilarities, suggesting a fetal skull size similar to the one of the neonate chimpanzee. Probably because Australopithecus afarensis's brain is not very big, and no one has ever claimed that it is Gunter. It is a, a link between Miocene apes and early genus Homo. So here we are in Burge et al. 1994, and uh, wouldn't you know it, we got a nice little abstract here. Let, let's see what they have to say. Oh, hey, what's this? A series of deductions leads us to suggest a Homo-like obstetrical mechanism for Australopithecus, characterized by the rotation and flexion of the neonate, with fetal skull sizes similar to the one of the neonate chimpanzee uh, in the pelvic cavity. That's kind of what Gunter said, uh, except for the part where it's a Homo-like obstetrical mechanism, not some human characteristics, but a Homo-like obstetrical mechanism. Boy, isn't that fascinating? That's a little weird, Gunter. It's a little weird that you decided to characterize it the way that you did. Um, one might even call it suspicious. We don't even need to check this next source because Beckley just accidentally gives the game away here in this portion that he decides to cite. This is from Yule Rock 1991, who also had a symposium this year uh, at the ABAs, concluded that Lucy's pelvis therefore does not represent simply an intermediate stage between a chimpanzee-like hominoid and homo sapiens, nor is it essentially a modern human pelvis. Although clearly bipedal and highly terrestrial, Lucy evidently achieved this mode of locomotion through solution all her own. So not simply, as in not just an intermediate stage, uh, because it is an intermediate stage. So Yolrock is not agreeing with you, Gunter. Uh, Hauser and Schmidt, 1995, compared three reconstructions of Lucy's pelvis by Lovejoy Schmidt and the authors, who revealed marked differences between STS-14 and AL-2881, which are unlikely to be explained by different methods of reconstruction. Well, given STS-14 and Lucy are separated by 700,000 years, I would suspect that there would be some differences in their pelvic morphology. But Gunther... I think you're not reading your own sources again. I think you might be pulling them from, from a different place than just going to <laughs> the literature itself. Because the very next sentence after the one that you cite, after it says they're unlikely to be explained by different methods of reconstruction, it says a re-examination of sexual characteristics together with an analysis of the birth mechanism led to the conclusion that the morphologically different birth canals of STS-14 and Lucy could be interpreted as reflecting sexual dimorphism in small-bodied gracile australopithecines. Naughty, naughty. And Gunter's last source is on the waiting hypothesis, which is like a, it's kind of like an aquatic ape adjacent, a more reasonable aquatic ape. Um, and they, they quote, they're quoted here as saying, the general shape of the pelvis of Australopithecus afarensis is confirmed to be functionally different, fundamentally different from both homo and extant great apes and not attributed between them. Uh, except if you go and look at the PCA analyses that they have in there, it's closest to homo. It's closest to humans uh, in, in basically every one of their analyses that they perform. So you can come and check this out for yourself. The green is Homo, whereas this little exploding box here is Australopithecus. And every time we look, we find that that little exploding box um, is, is almost always closest to Homo. There are a few exceptions. Closest to Homo here in table one, or in uh, figure one, uh, off by itself in figure two, uh, closest to Homo in figure three, uh, and in figure four, closest to Homo, and so on and so forth. So moving back, <laughs> let's see what Gunther says next. Basically, he did all of this to try and justify uh, Luskin, to save Luskin here. He says that experts disagreed so much about the interpretation of the pelvis and its reconstruction. No, they didn't. 
Absolutely not. What they disagreed on was whether or not the pelvis was indicative of full-time bipedalism, uh, terrestrially speaking, or terrestrial bipedalism sometimes and arboreality other times. What no one disagreed on was that the pelvis was indicative of bipedalism when on the ground and that the reconstruction, for the most part even in Stern and Sussman, was wholly correct and appropriate. Um, <laughs> and then he tries to justify this little phrase here again. No, no, he didn't. Um, that, that is not justifiable in any shape, form, or fashion. At least he does say this. All that said, would it have been better for the narrator to say that Dr. Lovejoy attempted to reconstruct the original configuration of the hip bone by manipulating a plaster cast of the fossil? Sure, but it would not have changed the core message. And one should also consider that this was only a seven-minute popular video and not meant as an exhaustive documentary. Uh, you still have to be right, Gunther. You still have to be right. So next we talk about the knee joint where um, <laughs> we get another citation from Stern of the Stern and Sussman fame uh, where they're saying, like Gunther is saying here, that it's not unanimous that Lucy had um, a, a valgus knee that was human-like in its capabilities. Uh, so let's check that one out. In this citation, Stern is actually citing somebody else. He's not stating that in and of himself. But since then, not only has further work confirmed the lockability and full extension of the Australopithecus afarensis knee, but we also see this same condition in other Australopiths, such as Australopithecus africanus or Australopithecus sediba. We're pretty close to the end here. We have uh, Lucy's foot morphology, so, so this should be good. He titles it Lucy's foot. In this section, and you'll notice I don't have a little bit of video to go on with this because I'm recording it later and my hair is wet now, so you're just gonna have to live with that. Uh, Gunther takes issue with the fact that Lucy is associated, or at least her species is associated, with the Laetoli footprints, and the Laetoli footprints are used as support for suggesting that Australopithecus afarensis, the species, was in fact bipedal. And to this, Gunther notes the fact that the Laetoli footprints are very far away from Lucy, the individual. Uh, he talks about how it's disputed by some individuals the association of the species with these footprints, quoting specifically Reichlin. 2010, who said, quote, the hypothesis is disputed by others based on differences between print morphology and fossilized foot remains. This is something of a classic Gunter Beckley move because that's a paper from 2010 and a significantly more recent paper, which is this one here by Hatala et al. from 2016, states clearly in the title, Laetoli footprints reveal bipedal gait biomechanics different from those of modern humans and chimpanzees. And the thing I like about this study as compared to the other is that it took an experimental approach by having modern humans who were unshod, so humans who don't wear shoes all day, walk in a similar substrate to that of the Laetoli footprints when they were initially made several million years ago. And then they had chimpanzees do the same thing. And then they measured the difference between the two of them in a statistical analysis. And they've got this lovely figure right here, which makes it abundantly clear that the Laetoli footprints uh, and the individual that made these trackways, the individuals that made these trackways are in fact distinct from both chimpanzees and humans. They were not made by humans or chimpanzees, but rather something rather intermediate. Hmm, curious. I think this is especially telling that Gunther chose to use an older study that agrees with his notion that whatever made the Laetoli footprints was not, in fact, Australopithecus afarensis, because he just spent the previous several paragraphs noting that Australopithecus afarensis actually had a bipedal locomotor style that was distinct from humans and from chimpanzees in its own right, something that this study on the Laetoli footprints actually supports, so no surprise that he didn't mention it. I'm gonna say it again here, just in case I didn't say it enough times earlier, but no one is proposing that hominin evolution is anagenetic. So in fact, Australopithecus afarensis is allowed to have unique characteristics. It still represents a transitional morphology, and to quote Kimball and Vilmore, one that meets Darwinian expectations. Um, we have uh, Gunther trying to punt the little foot specimen, uh, as if this specimen would document the foot morphology of Lucy. It's another Australopith, Gunther. I, I don't know why you're having trouble grasping this, but members of similar genera typically have similar locomotor styles, as I've said many times before. Um, you also criticize Dave Verena for saying that it's Australopithecus uh, africanus instead of Australopithecus prometheus, but Australopithecus prometheus is subsumed into Australopithecus africanus 
by pretty much everybody except for Clark himself. Um, and then you go on to say that only the basal part of the left foot is preserved. Yes, it is an incomplete left foot, except you know what it does preserve? The inlined big toe. Um, and then he complains that there aren't enough specimens of Australopithecus because so many of them are in fact fragmentary. Uh, that's true, except altogether, and I actually got to hear this straight from Donald Johansson's mouth this past weekend, we have the remains of over 500 individuals of Australopithecus. Uh, and that tells us quite a bit, especially because we do have indeed several partial skeletons and oodles and oodles of skulls. Together, being a part of Australopithecus, telling us a lot about how these organisms moved, what they ate, their sexual dimorphism, etc. And in fact, we, we do know a whole lot about what they looked like um, because of that. Gunter gets mad briefly that there aren't more specimens that are full skeletons preserved of Australopithecus as a genus, and he talks about how the third skeleton in this line of three that he's specifically discussing belongs to a three-year-old child called Salam. This is the Dakika child, which includes the basal fragment of a foot. He says this foot was originally described as being clear evidence for bipedal locomotion, but a recent re-examination revealed that the fossil documents the ape-like foot of a tree climber, and he says De Silva 2018. So this is really interesting because it seems like Gunter can use more recent papers when it suits him, but he chooses to ignore more recent papers when they do not. He goes on to say this was considered unexpected because the only other fossil of the foot skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis is the isolated metatarsal bone of an adult AL333-160, which has been interpreted as evidence of an arched foot adapted for a bipedal gait. Well now, wait a second, Gunter. What are you saying here again? Let's, let's read that one more time. You say that the only other fossil of the foot skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis is an isolated metatarsal bone of an adult, AL333-160. But uh-oh, Gunter, what's this? This looks like the partial remains of AL333-115, which is a partial Australopithecus afarensis foot from Hadar, Ethiopia, Wah, wah, guess the one that you cited wasn't the only other foot remains of Australopithecus afarensis. That is just his normal state of being. He does it unironically. Man's collected all the infinity stones of cringe and ascended to a level beyond pathetic. Uh, and they say instead of considering a potential misattribution or misinterpretation, the scientists speculated the juvenile specimens were more arboreal climbers while the adults were more terrestrial walkers. So I'd like to take a quick minute to hop over to this paper by De Silva, because I've read De Silva's book, and I also saw De Silva at the AABAs this past weekend. Here's the abstract of the paper cited by Gunter. The functional and evolutionary implications of primitive retentions in the early hominin feet have been under debate since the discovery of Australopithecus afarensis. Ontogeny can provide insight into adult phenotypes, but juvenile early hominin foot fossils are exceptionally rare. We analyze a nearly complete 3.32 million year old juvenile foot of Australopithecus afarensis, the Dakika child, and we show that juvenile Australopithecus afarensis individuals already had many of the bipedal features found in adult specimens. Uh oh. Stinky. However, they also had a medium cuneiform trait associated with increased hallucinal mobility and a more gracile calcaneal tuber, which is unexpected on the basis of known adult morphology. So wouldn't you know it, it is <laughs> a mosaic of characteristics. Selections for traits functionally associated with juvenile pedal grasping may provide a new perspective on their retention in the more terrestrial adult Australopithecus afarensis. So, Gunter, this is another sneaky little bit of data manipulation, or at least source manipulation, on your part here. Bad job. Gunter says you can hardly expect a seven minute video that is not just about Lucy to go into all these controversial details. Uh, the video short statement suggesting that the reconstruction of Lucy's foot as human-like was going beyond the evidence was therefore pretty much accurate. No, it wasn't, because that reconstruction was informed by other remains and has continued to be informed by other remains, Gunther. Like, you're a paleontologist, again, you should know this. And then, then he just hand waves the entire thing, saying, in my view, the whole issue of bipedality in Australopithecus, even if well established, is relatively moot because of their growing evidence that an upright posture and some form of bipedalism was present in European Mycene apes like Danuvius and Rurapithecus, and thus can no longer be considered as firmly establishing a closer human relationship. 
Gunter, do you think they're bipedal in the same way? Because I study Miocene apes, and they aren't. In fact, there's quite a bit of hubbub as to whether or not Danuvius was even an extended limb clamorer. Rudopithecus isn't proposed by very many people as even being bipedal in any sense. And if they were, they would have had to have been bipedal in the trees, because their pelvis are incredibly primitive. Their frame and magnum is not anterior to the degree that we see in even Ardipithecus, they don't have an inline big toe with three arches in the foot, and they don't have a valgus knee. They don't have any of the characteristics of a biped uh, that is that is effectively on the way towards human efficiency. Australopithecus is, by contrast, almost there. So you can't actually just get away with saying nonsense like this. Like you're you're going to get called out. Uh, and then he then he talks about the Tracheos prints. I'm not even going to dignify the Tracheos prints uh, with a response, especially that they might belong to Gregopithecus. They're probably not even footprints, Gunther. I, I really hate to tell you that. But even if she was fully bipedal, it was not a human form of bipedalism. It was an almost human form of bipedalism, if not a human form of bipedalism, as agreed upon by basically every citation that you just that you just gave us. She doesn't make a clear cut intermediate leading to our genus Homo, um, as some of the above quoted experts admit. Admit as if this is like pulling teeth. Again, I'd like to note that all paleoanthropologists appreciate that Australopiths were bipedal when they were on the ground, and the majority of them suggest that Australopithecus as a genus was as or nearly as efficient at being bipedal as genus Homo. And all remains of genus Australopithecus point towards this brute fact. Gunther, you didn't even read the sources, as I think we, we supported quite well. Um, and then he complains again, saying in Farina's presentation, his opponents, his opponents are charlatans. They engage in toxic and infantile behavior, deliberate and malicious dishonesty. And he's, he's mad that uh, these words are being used against the DI. You know, all of this sounds pretty familiar as kind of the language that, that you were using towards me earlier in this video, Gunther. So... I'm really tired. I spent all day doing this video instead of doing other things that I probably should have been doing, but I think it was worth making. I, I think Gunter deserved to be uh, chastised here because his behavior in the article that he wrote about me was, and I will repeat for like a third time, potentially even fourth if you count the email that I sent Gunther, it was incomplete, selective, and ignorant. And in fact, it actually matches basically the entire catalog of Gunther's blog posts on hominid evolution, which is why they are blog posts and not very popular ones at that. And these are just the mistakes that I could find in one morning of looking and an afternoon of recording. Imagine what we could do if we had even more time to devote I am more than happy to use my much larger platform to alert my audience to the fact that Gunter Beckley uh, is is kind of an asshole, to be honest, right? Like he is perfectly happy to point out the the, the the stick in other people's eyes when he's got a plank sticking out of his own, at least with regard to behavior. And like he does all of that while simultaneously being wrong about just about everything he talks about with regard to hominid evolution. Wow, fitting the theme of creationism to a T. So, Gunter, I really hope you take what I've said in this video and chew on it for a little while, both with how you conduct yourself as this world-renowned paleontologist or world-recognized paleontologist, as you've described yourself, um, as a member of the DI, which has a pretty strict religious affiliation, not really behaving very Christ-like on your end now, are we? Um, and as a scientist, which your conduct there is just objectively poor in addition to all of those other things. Um, you, you're poor at being kind and you're poor at being correct. So two for two on that. Way to go. Anyways, my gentle, of course, very modern apes, it's been a while since we've had like a, a really long video like this, like diving into somebody's catalog. But like I said, I think it was worth it. I'm curious to see how Gunther will react to this. Based off of how he has reacted to uh, Dave Farina's busts of him, I suspect he will uh, respond explosively because he can't seem to control himself. And if and when he does, I certainly hope that he does go through what I've said here with a fine tooth comb. I make mistakes. It's possible I've made mistakes in this video, but I don't think so because we, we walked through all the articles ourselves. I didn't just quote them at you out of context. We had them sitting in their full context and of course they're all available for you to search for as well and I encourage you to do so for anything that I ever cite. 
So um, I think our conclusion here is that Gunther Beckley is uh, a, a jerk and that he's also not very good at science, at least not with regard to, to hominins or other topics, but um, that's not really for me to say. I'm sort of taking other people's word for that. So my gentle and, of course, very modern apes, if you like what I do here, if you like this kind of thing, if you like looking at me stay up way past my bedtime to, to rant and rave about uh, a lunatic who is, like, just absolutely losing his mind in his blog posts because I, I pissed him off, um, please consider supporting this channel in the free way by liking, commenting, and subscribing. And if you want to support me a little bit more in perhaps a financial way, you can join my Patreon. Those guys usually get early access to videos. You could also, like, buy things from my Redbubble store or donate to my PayPal account. Everything helps. And so, gentle, modern apes, I hope to see you guys really soon next time. We'll continue with our regularly scheduled programming. Thank you.